I'm just afraid you could walk those, uh, walk through those for us, please, and, and get us uh, get off with this agenda item, please. Thanks, yes, ma'am. Uh, annually, at your January meeting, uh, the board makes several appointments, including chair, vice chair, and to a number of committees, as well as set your uh, board regular board meetings for the rest of the following year, and make other certain um, uh, declarations relative to weather and holidays. That is all done in the form of a resolution. That resolution is included within the packet. Within that resolution, there are several um, indiv independent steps through which the board will step to make the various uh, selections and then adopt the entire slate by resolution of the uh, when complete. Uh, I would be happy to start the process for the board and then, depending on who the chair is, the chair can take over from that point or not. To the rest of them. Thank you. No, I guess that gets us started. Uh, I've modified the form slightly this year to more closely align with Robert's rules. The Board of Supervisors does not follow Robert, Robert's rules as your uh, parliamentary procedure, uh, but it's a good model to use for situations like this. So as we move through these, uh, we'll ask for nominations for a position. Uh, which may be in any number. No, no second to a nomination is necessary. And then I'll ask to be clear whether there are any further nominations. And if there aren't, we'll close nominations and take a vote. Your vote would be by signifying which among the people who were nominated you uh, would cast your vote for. And I think we can move through these much more smoothly in that way. Uh, so that said, uh, the first item is the, to elect a chairperson to serve until the successor is elected at the organizational meeting this time next year, January 2022. Uh, I would accept any nominations that may be for chairperson. Uh, I'd like to nominate Mr. Wilson. If there's no other nominations, I would move the nominations be closed. I would like to nominate uh, Debbie Donahue. Are there any other nominations? I have Mr. Whitson, Ms. Dunahay on the floor. Hearing none, I'll close those nominations and report through a roll call vote. Um, start from the other end of the table and move this way. Mr. Frazier, you can vote for it. Whitson. Mr. Whitson. Ms. Dunahay. <laughs> Ms. Dunahay. I'll vote Donahue. Mr. Parrish? I'll vote for Donahue. Ms. Smith? I'd vote for Claire Winston. Uh, Ms. Donahue, uh, you are our new chair. I vote for three to two. If you care to take things over, would you like me to proceed? I think you do a fine job. Please proceed. Uh, next is Vice Chair. Uh, similar to serve until the success was elected at the organizational meeting of uh, the board in January 2022. Uh, accept nominations for vice chair. I would like to nominate Chris Parrish for vice chair. I would move the nominations be closed. Uh, as I noted earlier, I wasn't going to have, take motions to close nominations. I'll just and ask whether there are any other nominations and then we'll close it if there are none. That way we don't have to have multiple votes. Any other nominations for vice chair? Hearing none, by acclamation, Mr. Parrish will be the vice chair. Uh, next is the appointee to the Rappahannock Rapidan Regional Commission. Uh, this is typically uh, filled by the chair, and the county administrator also serves, but I will accept nominations for appointment to the Rapidan Regional Commission. This time, I agree. Are there any other nominations for Rapidan Rapidan Regional Commission? Hearing none, we'll close. We just don't need to be appointed by acclamation. Next is an appointee. Is 
the board's representative on the Rappahannock County Planning Commission. Again, until the successor is elected at organizational meeting in January 2022. Accept nomination for the board of supervisors representative to the Planning Commission. I'm uh, nominate Mr. Frazier. I'll nominate Mr. Whitson. Are there any other nominations represented to the Planning Commission? Here again, you have before you Mr. Whitson and Mr. Frazier. We'll start at this end. Mr. Smith. Mr. Frazier. Mr. Smith. Mr. Parrish. Uh, Mr. Whitson. Ms. Donahue. Mr. Whitson. Mr. Whitson. Whitson. And Mr. Frazier. Abstain. <clears throat> Mr. Whitson will be your appointee. Uh, next is the appointee to serve as the Board of Zoning Appeals representative on the Planning Commission. Of the BZA forwarded a recommendation to the board and then attached to this agenda item. Well, now, I can nominate Mr. Alex Sharp, member of the BZA. I would, like, sorry, I would like to nominate Steph Ritter. Discussion. Are there any other nominations before we close nominations? Discussion. Uh, both our county ordinance and the Code of Virginia stipulate that we should be appointing uh, experienced knowledgeable people to the Planning Commission. And I think that uh, we just uh, appointed Mr. Whitman, who has not served in that capacity before. You're looking at the least experienced Planning Commission in the last 40 years if we appoint another new person to the Planning Commission. I, I think we need to look at having some experience on there. That's the reason I nominated Mr. Sharp. So, uh, I would say that Stephanie Ritter has been in the county for many years. She's been on the periphery of the county government for a long time. She uh, served as the uh, president of the uh, Virginia Outdoors Foundation, which is a pretty uh, high position. And uh, she's uh, very conservation minded, and she's also an attorney. So, you know, it's a tough, tough call. So, I'm both extremely well qualified. So, Charlotte does have a lot of experience, I will say. I just don't understand how we would put someone on the planning commission that has been on the BCA for only about three months, four months. We know that the BCA's recommendation was for Mr. Makala, who is second in seniority to Mr. Sharp. If we're not going to do what the BCA has recommended that we do, I think we should do something that's still incredibly prudent and appoint somebody that has a record of service that has served on the BCA and the Planning Commission previously, and also brings a background with the Water and Sewer Authority. Um, it will be a lot of challenging work on the agenda this year for the Planning Commission. And I, I just think some experience is really needed to sort of it. <clears throat> Any further discussion? Any further nominations? Hearing none, I'll accept your vote for appointee to the Planning Commission from the Board of Zoning Appeals uh, in the middle of this time, Mr. Parrish. Uh, it's a tough call. Uh, I guess I'll, I guess after all I'll go with uh, Mr. Sharp. Ms. Dunahan. I agree, it is a tough call, and I know this is a very important year for all of us, so I will also go with Mr. Sharp. Mr. Wilson. 
Mr. Craig, I appreciate your comments and insight, and I'll, I'll agree to uh, support Mr. Sharp. Mr. Frazier? Sure. And Mr. Smith. Mr. Sharp, I'll give you a point to you. Next on the list is a uh, board's representative to the Rappahannock River Basin Commission. Uh, this requires an appointee and an alternate. We'll go to the appointee first, and then we'll uh, have the alternate second. We'll take nominations for the appointee to the Rappahannock River Basin Commission. I'll nominate Mr. West. Are there any other nominations for appointee to the Rappahannock River Basin Commission? Hearing none, we'll close nominations, and Mr. Whitson will be your appointee by the proclamation. I have a nomination for the alternate to the Red Hank River Basin Commission. I'll nominate Mr. Kirsch. Any other nominations? Hearing none, we'll Close nominations and Mr. Parrish would be your point, uh, alternate point. Here. Next are two appointments to the to serve as members of the Public Safety Committee and LEPC when that body meets. Uh, these appointees will be members of the Public Safety Committee until uh, new appointees are appointed at the organizational meeting. Uh, in January 2022, uh, any individual board member can nominate up to two people to fill the two slots. Set nominations for Public Safety Committee. Uh, I would just add that I'm happy to continue to serve on this uh, committee and I nominate uh, Ron Frazier to serve. Is that a nomination for yourself, man? Uh, I mean, that, I think that's a little rude, but I accept the nomination. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. I'm voting for ourselves today, so it's hard to do. Okay, next is that wasn't a nomination for herself. I, I just figured if I did uh, Mr. Fraser the favor of nominating him that he might do the favor of that. <laughs> I'm not sure it's a favor, but I will return the uh, <laughs> message. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry. That made her feel really good. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'll catch up later when I'm going somewhere. <laughs> there are two uh, positions and two nominees. Um, or is there any other nominees for, uh, to serve as representatives on the Public Safety Committee? I would nominate Mr. Whitson. Any other nominations for public safety committee? Um, so it's it's two board members serving concurrently for one year term, right? Correct. <coughs> I'll uh, I'll go ahead and nominate Mr. Parrish. One more, you can have everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I think it's two years in a row you did that. A last call for nominations. Okay, I will call for a vote, but I'll ask you to uh, list two members from whom you, of whom you would like to be appointed uh, from the group of Mr. Whitson, Ms. Smith, Mr. Parrish, and Mr. Frazier. And uh, Mr. Whitson, you're the lucky first draw this time. Oh. Am I voting for two people? Two people. Mr. Frazier and Ms. Smith. Mr. Frazier. Well, that makes it pretty tough. I guess Ms. Smith this time. And myself, Frazier. 
Smith. I vote for uh, myself and Mr. Frazier. Ms. Parrish. I'll vote for uh, Frazier and Smith. And Ms. Donahue. I'll vote for Frazier and Whitson. Your appointee serves to Frazier and Whitson. Uh, next is the uh, board's representative to serve on the prior levy board until this time next year. Your organizational meeting in January 2022. The nominations for the board's representative to the prior levy board. I think Ms. Donahue has done a really good job on that uh, board this year, and I would nominate her for this position. Any other nominations for representative of the prior levy board? Hearing none, there's one nominee, and Ms. Dunn is able to serve on that nomination. Next is the elected uh, representative to serve um, as the board's representative on the Rappahannock Shenandoah Warren Regional Jail Authority Board. Uh, as your county administrator, I also serve on this board. All of the nominations for representative to the RSW Regional Jail Authority Board. Nominate Mr. Parrish. Any other nominations to serve on the Regional Jail Authority Board? Hearing none, nominations will be closed, and Mr. Parrish, by acclamation, will be representative on the jail board. Well, I've spent a night over there. Okay. <laughs> good food. Good food. <laughs> Next is the board's appointee to serve on the Agricultural and Forestal Districts Advisory Committee. And this position will be through your organizational meeting in January 2020. Two of the nominations for the members of the Agricultural and Forestry District Advisory Committee. Mr. Curry, who's our current representative? Mr. Parrish. Oh, yeah. no, I thought you were. I think it's Mr. Frazier. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe the body met one time during the I thought it was you. When he, they will meet in 2021. Maybe. We never met, I thought it was him. <laughs> <laughs> I'll nominate Mr. Frazier. Oh, they don't <laughs> <laughs> Any other nominations for Agricultural Enforcement Districts Advisory Committee? I will note that the group is, uh, takes actions in a series way. First the, this body, then the Planning Commission, then the Board of Supervisors. Uh, and they typically schedule their meeting just before a Planning Commission meeting. So in some ways, one would suggest that it would be convenient for the Planning Commission rep to be on this body. In other ways, one would suggest that a different set of eyes would be good uh, to have a separate uh, view of, of the topics. Any other nominations for Ag and Forestry, Forestry District Advisory Committee? Hearing none, of those nominations, and Mr. Frazier will be your representative. Board's representative served on the Rappahannock County Recreational Facilities Authority until uh, this time next year at your organizational meeting in January 2022. I'll accept nominations for the position to serve on the Rec Authority Board. I wish to nominate Ms. Smith. I no, nominate Mr. Whitson. He's <laughs> already served that, I think. It has some continuity. Any other nominations for representative to the Rec Authority Board? Uh, and there's just one supervisor on the board? Four, six person. Just one. 460, Eric, Nathan, R.D., Castellan, and Bob, 22,000, 700, would it make any sense to have two board members on this? Well, that would take an ordinance change for one. Okay. All right. 
I think uh, Miss Smith uh, picked a great candidate in Mr. Yowell and, and has shown and served on the Park Authority previously and she showed shown continuing interest in all the efforts going on in the park and it should be excellent. Yeah, I mean, if we're going to look holistically at the slate, I mean, I'd be happy to take this on, but I'd also like to take on the building committee this year, too. This isn't exactly a game show, but if we can make a deal, <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> I would gladly nominate the building committee when we get there. Not to give up any secret thoughts here. No, I'd be happy to serve on the RCA. I appreciate it. It's a great group, and they're very... Um, Enthusiastic and active, which is a wonderful combination. I'm hearing no other nominations speak to there any other nominations. Now we do have two nominations put forward, uh, so we'll just go through a vote and we'll start with uh, Mr. Whitson. Uh, Mr. Whitson or Ms. Smith? Ms. Smith. Uh, Ms. Donahue? Ms. Smith. Mr. Perry? Ms. Smith. Ms. Smith. Ms. Smith. Ms. Gray. Ms. Smith. Ms. Smith. Uh, next is the Rappahannock County Community Policy and Management Team. Uh, this is the organization or group that oversees the Children's Services Act. Um, with your current rep is Mr. Parrish. I'll take nominations for your CPMT representative. Mr. Parrish, I know this is, this is not a small role. Um, with all the change going on right now, though, would you be willing to keep it for a year? If so, I would like to nominate you for it. Um, you know, I would, I'm happy to have somebody else do it also. Um, I would be... Uh, I think I, I don't want to take on too much. Um, that's why I was hoping for continuity and sort of that even things out that perhaps he'd stay on this for these, another year. Yeah, these meetings typically take place during the work day every other week. Uh, I'd be glad to stay on for my last year. I appreciate that and, and nominate Mr. Parrish. Any other nominations for CPMT? Hearing none, Mr. Parrish will serve my information. Uh, next, there are uh, representatives to serve on the Rules Committee. Um, your resolution forming the Rules Committee includes two primary representatives and an alternate representative. I'll set nominations for the primary representatives up to two, and then we'll do the alternate efforts. So open the floor for your two primary representatives on the Rules Committee. I'll nominate Ms. Smith and Mr. Frazier. And Ms. Smith, I appreciate your stepping in a couple of times this past year. Sure, absolutely. Um, would you be willing to step in as the alternate? Sure, um, I agree that. That's how we kind of divvied it up last year. Yeah. Any other nominations for the primary of the rules committee, which we have Smith and Fraser on the floor right now? Hearing none, uh, Ms. Smith and Mr. Fraser will be seated by acclamation. And uh, if I could just have you reiterate your nomination for the alternate. I nominate Mr. Whitson as the alternate. Any other nominations for alternate on the Rules Committee? Hearing none, close nominations and Mr. Whitson will serve by nomination. <coughs> Next is the Building Committee. Uh, this committee also has two representatives from the board. So we'll accept two nominations from any one board member to choose. Open floor for nominations to the building committee. I'll nominate Mr. Frazier. I'll nominate Ms. Smith. 
any other nominations to the building committee? Is it two? Two. Two, seats. Yeah. two open seats and two nominees on the floor. Hearing no other nominations, I'll close nominations and Mr. Frazier and Ms. Smith will be appointed by the commission. And lastly, uh, the end of the resolution identifies your meeting schedule for the calendar year 2021. Uh, and uh, I will go ahead and read it just to be clear. Regular meetings of the board, sh the board shall continue to be held on the first Monday of every month, except for September 2021 regular meeting, which shall be held on the first Wednesday of the month in the courtroom on the Rappahannock of the Rappahannock County Courthouse, 250 Gay Street, Town of Washington, Rappahannock County, Virginia, must change pursuant to section 15.2-1416 of the Code of Virginia. Regular meetings shall begin at 2 p.m. and the consideration of business scheduled for that time shall be recessed and reconvened at 7 p.m. if there is further business to conduct. In the event the chairperson or vice chairperson, if the chairperson is unavailable, declares that weather or other conditions are such that it is hazardous for members to attend any regular meeting, that meeting shall be continued until the immediately following Wednesday or immediately following Monday in the case of Wednesday meeting. And the other board members and the press should be notified by the county administrator as soon as possible. Further, except as noted herein, in the end of the regular Monday meeting date falls on a holiday recognized by the Commonwealth of Virginia. That meeting shall be held on the following Wednesday without action of any kind of this board of board supervisors. No further notice, advertisement, further notice or advertisement shall be required as to any matter advertised for regular meeting continue to pursuant to this paragraph. These changes to the regular meeting schedule are authorized pursuant to sections 15.2, 1416, and 1419 of the Code of Virginia. The board desire to avoid conflict with the general district court, which uses the same meeting on Tuesdays, the next business day after the regular meeting day. So if I could have a motion and a second to adopt the resolution with all the appointments that we discussed earlier and including the regular meeting schedule is noted in paragraph 15. Now, so moved. Yes. Second. I'll second. We're both called to vote. Ms. Smith. Aye. Parish? Aye. Ms. Domine? Aye. Mr. Whitson? Aye. Mr. Frazier? Aye. Thank you very much. Ms. Domine, we'll look forward to this. Thank you. Next on the agenda is to adopt the agenda. <coughs> I'm sorry. My question was: There any There are no agenda items. There are no items added after the agenda's person. I didn't think so, but I mean, as far as today's already gone, I could have missed it. <laughs> <laughs> We have a motion. Do I have a second? I'm sorry, who made the motion? Was that Mr. Perry? I did. I will second the adoption of the, of the agenda as presented. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Next is the school report. Dr. Grinsley. Good afternoon happy new year for your friends in Panzerland. Today, all staff return from winter break, and we are working diligently to kick off the second semester and prepare for students returning to in-person learning on Monday. This week, teachers are finalizing semester one grades, participating in training, and continuing curriculum development on Canvas, the district's distance learning platform. The semester will officially begin for students this Thursday, January 7th, as a distance learning day for cohort A students, and Friday will be a distance learning day for cohort B students remote students and four-day students. Our CPS will resume the hybrid schedule starting on Monday the 11th. Although schools were closed for all students the last two weeks, our CHS did hold a winter intercession for juniors and seniors at risk for losing credit or graduation requirements. 
Winter intercession took place on Monday and Tuesday each week during break for several hours where students received individualized support and instruction. RCHS reports great results, making the difference for some students who are on the brink of losing credit based on outside circumstances and limited resources. Also, our sports season has officially begun. Athletic Director Courtney Atkins reports that resuming sports has truly lifted the spirits of so many student athletes, parents, and coaches. RCPS has received positive feedback about the safety measures and protocols in place. Although the limitation for 25 or less spectators is still in place by Governor Edict, we have been able to accommodate two tickets per athlete, as well as have games streaming online for outside viewing. Girls JV and varsity basketball have played three games already so far. Boys JV and varsity have played two games, and middle school boys basketball is slated to play their first game this afternoon. Varsity wrestling is scheduled for their first match on Thursday, January 7th. And Scholastic Bowl will begin virtual meets beginning on January 14th. Since sports have begun, rap athletics have not had any positive cases arise amongst players or coaches. We will continue to move forward with practices and competitions as long as our conditions allow. Rap athletics will continue to put in the time and effort needed to make our condensed season as successful and safe as possible. Um, and I did just receive the stats too on those games. Uh, JB uh, girls basketball 3-0, varsity girls basketball 0-3, boys JB basketball 1-0, and boys varsity basketball too. So doing pretty well so far. Um, Operation Gift Wrapped is underway, a collaboration between RCPS and the businesses of Rappahannock. Using the generously donated grant for staff wellness, the main focus of the program is to show appreciation for the RCPS teachers and staff, as well as encourage shopping locally. The program provides special discounts, gifts, and raffle items for staff at participating businesses. All teachers and staff were mailed a packet over the winter break containing a passport in which staff can track their progress at local businesses, $50 of gift wrapped dollars to be spent at participating locations, as well as a list of special discounts and deals available at those participating businesses. The program is a great way to honor the hard work of our school employees, but also provide a boost to our local businesses. Finally, at the school board meeting next week, the board will be discussing the governor's budget updated COVID-19 protocols that will be implemented uh, by the schools for second semester, an update on the School Wellness Center, and an update on our students' academic progress and SOL scores for the first semester classes. As always, we thank you so much for your support and advocacy for the youth and families of Rappahannock County. Do you have any questions for me? Always. Go ahead. Sure. <laughs> um, I mean, I think the big question, um, is when are schools going to get back to their normal schedule? Oh, I need it. No. <laughs> we, we're reviewing that at every board meeting so when we can begin phasing in our four-day students. Um, all students to four-day beginning on a trajectory from K to two, working right up through grade bands. Unfortunately, our pandemic dashboard that we use for those particular metrics have not met the benchmarks to be able to move forward with that. However, for second semester, we did um, revisit those surveys and sent out to all parents requesting the four-day to please reapply. And I'm happy to say I believe that every parent that applied for their kindergarten through fourth grade were able to be accommodated, which is a very um, specific targeted group. Uh, we also are using some of our local CARES Act money to bring in an additional teacher for at-risk struggling literacy students for grades K to two also to keep our class understanding. So, um, we've been able to move forward with that. Um, we're waiting for guidance from the state about the progress of the vaccine and when school staff might be able to uh, participate in that. Um, until then, I really don't have a great answer for you. We have to take it step by step. Is, is the dashboard something that you all have to adhere to or is that something that you created for metrics and want to aspire to meet? No, this, it's the CDC school metrics pandemic dashboard and it is available on the BDH site. Um, and school metrics were set by uh, the locality based on our own numbers and what we're seeing and where we are as far as risk of transmission, community versus in-school risk and those types of things. So um, in no case in phase three will you see schools close completely for us. I mean, other localities have done that, but you're not going to see that for us. Uh, there may be periodic adjustments being made to switch to virtual learning based on um, cases and contact tracing and those types of things. And communications will go out by the end of this week to better outline that process for everybody 
Um, so it'll, it'll lift some of that uncertainty about how we're making those decisions. Mr. Whitson. Uh, thank you, Ms. Donna. Thank you, Dr. Grimsley. Um, <clears throat> just a few questions. Uh, on the basketball front, um, where does your participation, means of participation in the context of the pandemic fit with what's going on in the state and what kind of COVID-19 protocols are in place? Obviously, you see a lot of close contact in the photos and the paper and all that. I just, I just wonder, are you operating under a particular protocol or is it play until people become ill and then they don't play? No, and they're the under plan? very specific VHSL guidelines for okay. participation in sports where there may be close contact. Um, and that's why you have seen the, the lowering of the number of spectators that come in from the outside. Basically, the uh, way you can look at it is all schools are implementing the same kind of safety protocols for in-school or practices, conditioning, workouts, all of those okay. things. So you have a low-risk pool plus low-risk pool yields low-risk at the end of that. When you bring in more outside influences to that, things outside of our control and those protocols, then that, the risk goes up. Um, so that's the reasoning behind that. Okay. Um, and then this morning I was driving past the high school and I realized it was a teacher work day because I also saw some maintenance type, type vehicles that were parked in the, the driveway right in front of the school. Any idea what what activity that might involve? Oh, there were small con there were small contractor trucks. I was just curious what was going on. Oh gosh, I don't, I don't know what's on the okay. docket for today. It could be any number of things. It could be okay. painting or you know, HVAC work or plumbing or whatever it's okay. called. <laughs> All right, and then uh, a related question. Could you just give us an update on your progress or level of completion on various pandemic-related capital, capital expenditures that we funded mm -hmm. um, last calendar year from CARES Act money and where things sure. stand? Well, the capital um, project, the, the main capital project was actually the auditorium. Okay. It is complete okay. and it's ready for use. So um, just use our regular facility use process to request the, the use of that for public meetings or otherwise. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. My one question is, how's morale? Morale? Um, I think it's really high compared to, you know, as well as can be expected. We're doing everything we can to pump up the staff. It is a, a, a tough time to be in education, and the stress and anxiety levels are very high. Um, and I think that's just the norm across um, all types of businesses and things. But for teachers especially, um, it's, it's been tough, especially with the polarization once it became political and all of these different things. Um, it's, it's been a rough road, but your Rappahannock staff are doing an incredible job, and they've been open since the beginning, so. Awesome. Thanks for all you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we're on to public comment. Um, five minutes or less, I believe, is the norm. Please state your name and the district you're in um, and address. Any public comment? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, board, and uh, happy new year to you all. It's a real blessing to be here uh, alive and well in 2021. Um, I believe on your agenda you have a presentation uh, by Mr. Acre about the Black Kettle Commons. I did hear that presentation at the Washington Town Council meeting, and it sounds like a very good project, and I would encourage the board to uh, vote in its favor and progress that project. Uh, I, however, have one uh, reservation as a member of the board of the Rappahannock League for Environmental Protection and for the Park Authority. The uh, RLEP has engaged on a four-year program of minimizing light pollution in the county by replacing over 230 lights on various businesses, churches, government buildings, and residences. And as a member of the board of the uh, RCRFA, we have earned a dark sky park designation, uh, a coveted designation for our park, and we hold outdoor activities in the evenings. We view this project on the, on the corner of, of Route 211 as a potential light source that, uh, if it is not done properly, could jeopardize our certification as the Dark Sky Park and undermine the work that RLAP has done across the county. Uh, we had similar concerns for the Cleveringer project, Cleveringer Corner project, an adjacent county, and we have submitted letters of concern and offered our 
uh, technical services to modify their lighting plan. And should the Black Kettles project come to fruition, uh, RLAP would offer the same uh, support in terms of technical consulting on a lighting plan so that responsible lighting could be provided for uh, that development. And I'm looking forward to some positive uh, feedback from the board on this project and some a good working relationship with Mr. Acre and his team. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks sir. Tom? A little bit wobbly today. Um, Tom Pelican. I live in the district of uh, Woodville, Virginia, where Mr. Paris represents me. I'm very proud of his reputation also. At 12 o'clock, I didn't intend to be here. <laughs> I drove into Little Washington, Virginia to deliver fresh farm eggs to friends of mine. And I had a question on my mind from the time I entered the town, and I've had it on my mind for over a month now, of um, a question that I wanted to approach the, the clerk of the, uh, the excuse me, um, Kim, who sits here in the audience today, about um, a question I had, and she didn't have the answer, or her staff didn't have the answer. I thought it was appropriate that they would. Um, I will tell you what the question was in a minute. Uh, and then I saw Ms. Chandler there, who also deals with this issue, and uh, she did not have the answer, but she was kind enough to, to that I recommend I see Ms. Summers in the zoning office. And I was gone there. I asked her the question, and she didn't have the answer, but she went and she prepared the answer, and, and, and she found it for me, and I bring it before you today. What I need to ask the board at this time, and congratulations on me, Ms. Chairman, um, is what are the guidelines, what are the ordinances on the placement of political signs prior to election and after election? Can somebody tell me what they are? Um, I can. I ran for election last year and I had a few signs. Yes. Um, so I read, read that provision of our ordinance and the sign ordinance specifically says that I believe the only time limitation, I don't think there's a time limitation on the front end when signs go up. But typically the tradition, I learned the hard way the first time I ran, tradition is to put them up no earlier than Labor Day. And I believe, and tell me if I'm wrong, Mr. Curry or Ms. Mr. Oh, this, I'm sorry, Four, I'm 14, sorry. 14 days. 14 days. 14 day, within 14 days after an election, they should be removed. Well, you're close. You're close. Seven days? I'll read you the ordinance, okay. the county ordinance. It says, temporary political signs shall not be erected more than 90 days prior to an election or referendum and shall be removed within 15 days after the elections. Persons responsible jointly or severely for the maintenance and removal of political signs are the candidates, spokesmen or campaign committees, the owner or occupant of the premises on which the signs are located, and the personal responsible for its erection. Um, this is an ordinance that's not enforced. It's not looked at. It's, it's, it's ignored. If I, if I could interrupt for right, a second. Right here? It's unenforceable. Why is it unenforceable? Because the Supreme Court ruled on the... Um, I'm talking about the code of the county's, I, it's county's not, it's statutes. It's not enforceable because the Supreme Court, unfortunately, has a little bit more of an authority than we do. What did they say exactly? I, I hate to interrupt all this, but this is not question and answer period. This is public comment. Period, I was just I was just really trying to stop the, the discussion. It I did really ask. For, I did if anybody had an answer why it's not enforced. It's, it's unenforceable because well, of a Supreme Court ruling. And I would subject that, suggest that if you have an issue that you've already visited the zoning administrator and the person to file a complaint with is the zoning administrator. That's the way to pursue your issue. I approached the zoning administrator, and, and she told me there was a the board meeting today, and I brought the I brought the uh, the summons or the the criteria on signs like you had signs before you before I know because of the signs etc. Um, this is political signs are supposed to come down in 15 days. And somebody's telling me the Supreme Court says it's okay. Well, we know who's on the Supreme Court, don't we? I, I, I yield the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Any 
Anyone else would like to speak? Yes, sir. Ron Mackle from Jackson District. I uh, just want to take a couple minutes of your time to uh, speak to you about uh, an issue that I think is being uh, neglected around here and it's creating a problem. That is the minutes of your meeting. You have on your agenda today minutes to be approved in the consent agenda that go back to July. Six months ago, you had that meeting. How can you even approve them? You probably can't remember what you did at that meeting six months ago. There's no excuse for the county being that far behind as far as minutes go. It's not fair to the public. I, you know, I would like to know shortly after a meeting what went on. And people will say, well, you can view the video. I can't view the video because I can't stream. <laughs> and even if you do stream, half the time you can't understand the audio. There's an answer. The state code under 2.2-3707.1 has postings of minutes for state boards and commissions. And this only applies in the, to the state boards. But there's nothing that would prevent us from adopting a similar regulation that would require that the minutes of the meeting at least be presented at the following meeting, if not sooner. And this should be for all boards in the county. And it because, uh, quite honestly, I'm a FOIA officer. It, it's verging on, on a, an extreme lack of transparency and can create FOIA issues in that people ask for information and a FOIA officer is unable to give it to them because the administration has no, hasn't made it available yet. So I would encourage you, it's a new year. It's not a big deal. And it just puts everybody on notice as far as you've got to produce it by a certain date. So if you could uh, go ahead and uh, take a look at that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Rob. <clears throat> Anyone else in the audience? Yes, sir. And uh, make the statement that I said earlier from here. Um, Ms. Summers in the zoning office told me that the county attorney would be able to the board. Yes, we do have uh, several people online. Uh, and while I haven't announced for them to raise their hand, I have at least one hand raised. One hand is raised? Yes. All right. Uh, there, are, there are directions on the screen for those who are um, using Zoom on how to raise your hand. All right, the person that has their hand raised, can we unmute them? And uh, that is Anita Ramos, and I've asked her to unmute. It's audio only, correct? This is audio only. And, a, and just a picture of the screen. Ms. Ramos, can you see if we can hear you? Yes, sir. I hope you can hear me. Okay. Yes, ma'am. You have the floor. I want, I want to wish you all, first of all, a happy new year. We hope that this will be a successful year to the Board of Supervisors and the entire county. Um, at this time, um, I've done this in past years. I want to take a moment to honor those people who have been served or employed or worked for the U.S. government in any way, shape, or form over time. And I also, at this time, want to add those people who have worked for our commonwealth, our county, our cities, and our towns. Um, many of you worked long, long, long hours, especially this past year, to help our nation, to help our county, to help our state. I hope that uh, we can continue to honor you and to thank you so many times because you all worked behind the scenes so much and rarely get the affirmation you deserve. Uh, with that, uh, thank you all and I'm going to change over to uh, watching you on Brat News so I can see your faces because I can't see you all on TV.
Thank you. Anyone else? On the call, there's uh, dial-in users can raise your hand by pressing star nine. iPad, phone, and Android users can select more and then raise hand. And then PC, Mac users can select participants and then raise hand. I'm seeing no other raised hands. All right. No other hands raised. We'll close public comment. We have one in the back. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> one. Mr. Glenn. Uh, Paige Glennie, Jackson District. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to address you regarding your Executive Order 72 compliance statement, your declared statement of emergency, the implementation of the paid EMS staff, and the Black Kettle Commons proposal. Regarding the executive order compliance statement, as obvious, I refuse to wear a mask to government meetings. There is no scientifically proven study that demonstrates the effectiveness of masks for preventing COVID. There are scientifically proven harmful effects of wearing a mask. The Pfizer vaccine study clearly showed that the risk of COVID are extremely small. The data analysis used to justify the mask mandate is flawed as discussed with VDH at your last BOS meeting. The county requiring individuals claiming medical reasons for not wearing the mask justified by VDH exceeds your authority. Neither the governor's order or any state law requires VDH justification. Therefore, under the Dillon rule, the county cannot add that requirement. By unlawfully denying access to public meetings, the county would be committing a FOIA violation. I strongly recommend the board rescind the requirement for VDH justification and state that the county accepts the medical reason exemption. Regarding the declared state of emergency, again, knowing the fire, Pfizer vaccine placebo results, the harmful effects of masks, and the spike in depression and abuse, why do you continue to follow Richmond's mandates? Why do you follow the advice of experts that profit from their advice? Why are you still using emergency powers? As Mr. Whitson pointed out last meeting, Rappahannock County is a COVID oasis. Sanctuary, sir. Sanctuary, sorry. What is, why is that? What makes us different? Whatever that is, that is what we need to reinforce. It's time for our local government, this board, to independently assess the situation rather than just relying on questionable, at best, direction from above that is based on statistically invalid analysis. Our local government has a duty to protect the citizens from all threats, even if those threats are from Richmond. This board needs to find the current, the correct balance for Rappahannock County, not subject its citizens to rules based on the large population centers of the state. Regarding the paid EMS staff, I fully endorse the Fire and Rescue Association recommendation of the 24-7 paid ALS staff located in Washington with a chase buggy as a solution to the immediate fire and rescue volunteer staffing challenges. I understand the Chester Gap need for paid EMT staff, but I disagree with all county taxpayers paying for community-specific needs with general county funds. If a given company cannot get the volunteer support they need, then just that community citizen should pay for the services. The county already pays for all the operational costs, and in the case of Chester Gap, even those costs associated with their responses into Warren County about 50% of their dispatches. Until such time that all companies need pay MT staff, a special overlay tax district should be established to pay for specific company EMT paid staff. Paying for individual company EMTs before it is countywide issue sets a precedent that could add significant cost, would be contrary to the centralized and cost-effective plan recommended by the association, and result in underutilized pay staff. 
Regarding the Black Cattle Commons proposal, I disagree with the boundary line adjustment. The county gets nothing for this proposed realignment or adjustment. The county would lose possible revenue from the potential businesses on the county portion of the parcel. parcel. It is, if it is truly, quote, common ground for everyone, both town and county residents, unquote, why not share the tax revenue from the parcel? Why can't the town sewer system make an exception if the town wants the project so bad? Thank you for your time and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. All right, last call. Public comment. Seeing none, hearing none, Mr. Curry? None on the line. We'll close public comment. And next is consent agenda. Need a motion if we're going to accept the consent agenda or? Um, Madam Chair, if we could pull the accounts payable from the consent agenda, agenda, please. All right, item number two will be pulled. I'll make a motion to reapprove the remainder of the consent agenda. Mr. Frazier made the motion, do I have a second? I'll second. Mr. Whitson, all those in favor say aye. aye. We aye. have to read our statements into the record for the accounts payable, right? Yeah, yeah that was just pulled out, so that would be okay. just pulled out, so we'll vote separately, right? Yep. All right, so the, vote, yeah. the vote for the That's consent fine. agenda pulling out number two and leaving everything else was all eyes, as far as I could tell. All right, now we'll go into um, the accounts payable portion. And we do have our letter or our paragraph to read. Ms. Smith. It would be most appropriate if you did that before discussion. Okay, Ms. Smith. Pursuant to the Code of Virginia, Section 2.2-3115H, as a Board of Supervisors member, I might have a personal interest related to the approval of the accounts payable process that includes consideration of a payment to Walker Jones, whose firm provides legal counsel related to the Brian Wong case. The nature of my potential personal interest is the fact that the named firm is providing for my legal defense as a member of the Board of Supervisors. I certify that my involvement in action as a group of three or more members of the Board of Supervisors that are affected by the transaction and that I am able to participate in the transaction fairly, objectively, and in the public interest. All right, pursuant to the Code of Virginia, Section 2.2-3115H, as a Board of Supervisors member, I have a personal interest related to the approval of the accounts payable process, which includes consideration of a payment to Walker Jones, which firm provides legal counsel related to the Bragg One case. The nature of my potential personal interest is the fact that the named firm is providing for my legal defense as an individual and a member of the Board of Supervisors. I certify that my involvement in action is as a group of three or more members of the Board of Supervisors that are affected by the transaction and that, and that I am able to participate in the transaction fairly, objectively, and in the public interest. Pursuant to the Code of Virginia, Section 2.2-3115H, as a board of supervisor member, I might have a personal interest related to the approval of the new, I mean, of the accounts payable process that includes consideration of a payment to Walker Jones, which firm provides legal counsel related to the Bragg One case. The nature of my potential personal interest is the fact that the named firm is providing for my legal defense as a member of the board of supervisors. I certify that my involvement and action is as a group of three or more members of the board of supervisors that are affected by the transaction and that I am able to participate in the transaction fairly, objectively, and in the public interest. I will read quickly so I don't fog up before the end here. Uh, pursuant to the Code of Virginia Section 2.2, 31.15.H as a board of supervisors member, I might have a personal interest related to the approval of the accounts payable process. That includes consideration of a payment to Walker Jones which firm provides legal counsel related to the Bragg One case. The nature of my potential personal interest is the fact that the name firm is providing for my legal defense as a member of the Board of Supervisors. I certify my involvement in action as a group of three or more members of the Board of Supervisors who are affected by the transaction that I am able to participate in the transaction fairly objectively and in the public interest. 
Mr. Frazier? Uh, I'll decline to read. Uh, Walker Jones never represented me. Thank you, sir. All right, Mr. Whitson, you pulled the counts table. I did. I just had one question. I, there are two check runs. Um, and in one of them, I noticed it's not the amount of the payment, but to whom there was a uh, an invoice paid to Updike, which was our former refuse and recycling service provider. And I wonder if Mr. Curry might have a handle on what that invoice was and, and why we're paying them five months after the end of the contract. Oh, the Duke still provides service for us for our dumpster. Sorry about that. Is it under the name of Upton? Yeah, it was. $209? Yeah. That's for the dumpster service behind the, the buildings here. Oh, okay. So, all right. My I, mistake. I have a question, too, uh, while we're there looking at these. A uh, check uh, for $930 to Greenhand, Tavis, and Pandak. I believe that's a law firm. That's uh, on 209, the library. The library board hired uh, that firm to represent them in developing the contracts for architectural services. Really? Really. Hmm. Anybody else? I've got a couple of questions. Um, with regards to Muskrat Haven, I think you explained that that was the... That's for deer processing. Deer, processing. The, uh, deer donated and then food provided to the food bank. And I'm just wondering how that process works because I seem to have a lot of deer in my area. <laughs> and Mr. Parrish may know best. So yeah, uh, years ago I decided to uh, pay for the processing. It was $50 now, it's $75 I think uh, right. as of this year. So if uh, a lot of people fill up their freezers but they still want to keep uh, hunting and so they can bring the excess deer to uh, this facility and they will process it and turn it over to the food pantry. So it's food, it's free food for the food pantry. The, it's, and I've always been concerned about the deer population in the county and this is one of the couple of things that we've been doing to help control that aside from the earn a buck program. So uh, that's, that's what that is. Okay. I guess the more we can advertise that, the better. Deer season's over now. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's... Uh, also, if people have a kill permit, they can uh, take it any time of the year, uh, and they'll, they'll process it and turn the meat over to the uh, food pantry. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Back to the refuse in general, Mr. Curry, I know I had asked for um, an update just to make sure that everybody knows uh, how we're doing with the uh, amount that you expected we would be paying and where we are today, the actuals. Yes, I did run those numbers, and we're... Um, right on track with the forecasted budget. That's uh, probably an accident, but it is what it is, and we'll take it. Uh, we are paying a little bit more for recycling than predicted and a little bit less for uh, refuse, and I suspect that's due to us recycling more than, than we have in the past. Or um, the record-keeping from our last provider wasn't the best, and so now we have very good records, and we know we're very confident of exactly what's leaving our sites. Thank you for that. I, it, I don't care if it's luck or not. It's nice to be that close to what you uh, let us know about what last February, I think. Um, Mr. Curry, the other piece of this, of course, is the tax savings that we promised our citizens, which I think we roughed in at maybe upwards of $250,000 a year. If you isolate, am I correct, it's been five months now that we've been with Page County? Correct. And if you were to isolate a comparative period under the last vendor from a prior year, have you looked to see whether we're on track to, to meet that tax savings? Let me correct. We've been with Page County a little bit longer. Uh, the first five months of the fiscal year we have uh, paid. Okay. And uh, during your next mid-month run, you will pay the six months. Uh, but we're uh, paid approximately $100,000 less in this first five months as compared to the la previous years when we were using the last provider. So if you were to extrapolate that across a 12-month period, then it would show that we're possibly on track for the $250,000 savings. Correct, which is why the budget's right in line. Yeah. Okay. All right, anything else on uh, accounts table? 
All right, let's move on to prison. Yes, we have to we need to vote on Oh, that. we need to vote, sorry. Uh, do I have a motion? I'll make a motion. We can pay the bill. I have a second? I'll second. Thank you. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you for that. Presentations. Uh, the first one we have is the electoral board update. The very I got it. It'll go down. Thank you. Thank you. Um, honorable members of the Board of Supervisors, Mr. Curry, Mr. Goff, and members of the public, thank you for asking Kim McKiernan, the Director of Elections, and myself here today to give you a report on how the election process went. My report does not include any duties of the registrar who spent countless hours preparing for, ordering for, organizing for, and conducting this unprecedented general election. Kim, I just publicly want to thank you for your outstanding job. As chairman of the Rappahannock County Electoral Board, made up of both Democratic and Republican representatives, I'm happy to report that we were extremely pleased with the workings of the registrar's office during this time of COVID-19, how well our staff performed under incredible stress and with the issuance of more than 69 new election laws from the Virginia legislature and the number of last minute directives that we had to follow. Um, our dedicated election officials and our county's voters whose turnout was in record numbers. As you know, we have approximately 7,500 residents in the county. As of November 1st, 2020, there were 6,107 registered voters. The registrar's office served over 5,000 of those voters for this November 3rd, 2020 election. In total, 4,962 votes were cast and counted in our precincts, in our seven precincts, which included the six precincts plus the cap. This includes ballots cast by overseas and military voters ballots cast during early voting in the registrar's office, votes cast at the precincts on election day, and absentee by mail ballots received and processed at the central absentee precinct, which we call CAP. We had 33 election officials serving those precincts who received both online training and in-person training by the electoral board and the registrar's office. Each of these officials must take an oath to uphold their duties impartially. During the two days of in-person training, the election officials were made aware of or were taught new laws affecting voting this year, COVID-19 regulations, and the use of personal protective equipment issued by the Commonwealth, how to properly set up their precincts to minimize any contamination by ill voters, how and where to record all numbers from the safety locks and seals on each piece of election equipment, proper use of election day equipment, which includes the electronic poll books and optical scan voting machines, how to open and close the polls to ensure there were no votes previously cast for the election on any optical scan or voting machine at the start of the day, and to ensure that the counter tapes registered zero. This process must be validated and signed by our election officials at each precinct. And finally, they were taught how to close the polls. Most of these people have been with us for years. Election officials are also taught how to ensure when a vote is cast on the optical scan machine, how to check in voters to ensure voter credit, and how to be certain whether a voter was already issued or not issued an absentee ballot by mail. This is mandatory prior to a voter being allowed to vote at the polling location. They're also taught what to do if a voter was previously issued an absentee ballot. They're taught how to record the votes cast at the end of the day on the statements of results and report them as unofficial results to the registrar's office after the polls close at 7 p.m. 
They're taught how to dismantle the equipment and which specific envelope every item from the election needs to go into and which envelopes to seal with a protective lock. This includes storage of a duplicate set of memory cards that records votes cast on the optical scan voting machines, voted and unused ballots, provisional ballots, any unvoted or voted absentee ballots that were returned to the precinct. There is a place for everything. Election officials are also taught how to check credentials of political party observers and the rules for the observers in the polling places and what the press may do at voting precincts. We have an incredibly dedicated group of election officials to whom the voting process is the most important thing of the day. It is not who wins or who loses that is important, but rather that Americans, that as Americans, our voices are heard and our choice be known through the democratic electoral process that keeps our country on an even keel. Prior to the election, the electoral board and registrar's office performs logic and accuracy testing on all optical scan voting machines used by the seven precincts and one spare machine kept in the registrar's office. This procedure was observed by representatives of the local political parties. This means we zero the machines so there are no votes on them. We insert training ballots with votes the electoral board marked for candidates into the machines, including undervoting and overvoting. We check and validate that the votes we cast for each candidate matches the test results when we close the machines out. We then delete those votes and re-zero the machines to make them ready for the election. We clean the machines, seal them with locks, record the lock serial numbers, and secure the optical scan machines. Additional duties the electoral board completes is to canvas the three days following the election. That means we certify the votes that were cast and determine which provisional votes may be counted. The canvassing procedure was observed by local representatives of both political parties. After the polls close, each precinct must complete a statement of results and include printed tapes produced by the machine calculating the total number of votes for each office, the number of votes for each candidate, the number of overvotes, the number of undervotes, and the number of writing candidates. The electoral board uses the statements of results to verify the accuracy of what was reported to the director of elections as preliminary results. We're able to accomplish this as every machine in every precinct has a secured closed protective counter that records how many votes were ever recorded on the machine. This number is recorded when the polls are open, and at the end of the day, the protective counter number is again recorded. This shows how many votes were cast on that optical scanner. Every machine also has another counter that starts at zero. At the end of the day, the total votes are recorded. These numbers must match the number of voters who were checked in to vote and the number of votes cast and recorded on the statement of results. It is also important to know that at the polls, no voter is turned away. If there is a problem, a voter may vote a provisional ballot. During the canvassing process, the electoral board will determine if the voter has the right to cast that provisional ballot. Every vote cast must be accounted for and all votes must be certified. Once this is accomplished, the electoral board signs an abstract provided by the Commonwealth and the votes are submitted to the Department of Elections. All ballots, voted and unvoted, memory cards from the optical scanners, required forms, certified forms, are then transferred to the custody of the clerk of Rappahannock Circuit Court to secure storage in their vault in accordance with state law. Again, for members of the electoral board, it is not who wins or loses, but the sanctity of the vote that is of premier importance. 
I thank you for listening to a very brief overview of the major steps in conducting an election, and we invite each of you to join us when we prepare for the next election in 2021. Please come by. It is a fascinating process and the backbone of our democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask one brief question? Sure, Chris. First of all, I commend that office on their organization and uh, thoroughness, and uh, just delighted that, you know, it's such a tight ship run here in the county. I'm just curious, uh, when you certify the elections, you said there's, there's watchers that come in? Can, both? I, I can't, I'm having problems hearing, I'm sorry. Can you say that again? When you certify the election, you know, within the three days after right. the election, uh, you said that they were uh, poll watchers that would come in from both political parties. Mm -hmm. how, how many are, that's a pretty small room that you do that. How many people are allowed to come in? Can, we had, I think we had one, one, um, yeah, so there were five of us. Five of us in the room? Okay. Three electoral board members, myself. And then one, one, yeah. And there was one poll watcher? One poll, are, yeah. yeah, okay, observer. It, it's a tight space, you know that. Right, yeah. And of course, I was there for 27 well, years, and I never that never happened when I was there. But yeah, well, yeah. it's it's a different time. I know, and, and thank have, God I'm not there anymore. We have. Oh, come on. No thanks. <laughs> <laughs> the fun's out of it. <laughs> we always extend invitations to both the Democrats and the Republicans, uh -huh. and sometimes you will have one party represented. Sometimes you'll have two parties represented. Right. But we try to let right. everybody know exactly yeah. when they're it's, they're invited. It's state law. And I have to know if I go local, local. Exactly. Testing yeah. Right. So it's always. And within the polling places during the time of voting, uh, who's who's allowed to be inside the building? We other than the election officials. The election officials, and you're allowed to have observers, but the observers have to have present credentials to the the chief of the election pre at, the, at that specific precinct. They may not interfere with any of the voting. They may sit there. They may listen to who right. is being checked in. Right. Um, they, so how many of each party are allowed to be inside uh, the voting uh, area? We usually have, we can one have one of each, of each party, party, each right. major political party. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I didn't really have a question, but I did have a comment. I know that I had received some concerns from a constituent during the primary, which I had passed along to you all, because during the primary, only one person was allowed in the polling place at a time to vote. And I understand that there weren't any of those kinds of problems on Election Day. So I just wanted to thank you for opening up the polling places so that people could get out and, we, and vote on Election Day. Our election officials really... Um, during training, we all went through this, and they reconfigured the way the each precinct was so that they used a front door and a back door. And I think Chester Gap was the only one that only has one door, but they were trying to keep the flow of traffic so that everybody was able to just keep moving and keep away from each other. Thank you for doing that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much Thank for your you. service. I appreciate you inviting uh, I, uh, us. Madam Chair, I had a question. Sure. Um, so you had a, a poll watcher from each political party when you were doing most of this process? It, if they, they were invited to come, and it, Kim, do you remember who was there? This is just one party. One party came? Okay. But both parties were notified and spoke to me. So. Yeah, I, I had heard, I don't no, that's maybe you could verify it, but I was told that uh, when you get to the part uh, where the poll watchers were watching the uh, opening of the outer envelopes, I guess they were for absentee ballots, the date had already been cut open before the poll watcher was there to, to observe that? You know, they're told, they're also told what time the things are going to start. And we had an inordinate, in, incredible amount of absentee ballots. Right. You know, and we had to get that done. I can address that. Sure. Due to the anticipated volume, um, one of the new laws that was passed was pre-processing. Um, and it actually allowed the registrar and staff to do a lot of it, which I want no part of. One of the things we could do to expedite it was just slip that envelope so that when our election officials were pre-processing, 
they just pulled that envelope out and matched the name and address to the name and address on the outside of the envelope and could go from there processing it. The vote, the ballot, the marked ballot wasn't seen by us and that secrecy is very heavily guarded. But they, so then they actually were cut open before a poll watcher could see that. Yeah, I mean, we processed them. We, we checked them in on the machine. We... Can, I, can I say something to this? Ron, the, the ballot is put in an envelope. I understand that. That envelope is sealed. That envelope then goes in an outer envelope. So right. by slitting the outer envelope, you have no idea what is on the inside part of the other envelope because it is still sealed. I understand that, but the, the complaint that I received was, and I think that's probably what, what prompted me to ask for this presentation to start with so that I could ask that question. Once that envelope is slid open, there's, there's actually no verification if something had been changed back and forth. And that's what their complaint was. Not know. that it happened, it's that protocol wasn't followed. Is that, is that correct? Kim, I'm going to let you, why don't you get it? Um, and um, envelope B that voters seal their marked ballot in has a back side where they have to fill it out and sign it. If it has been opened even before we open the exterior envelope, then we have a problem. And one of the new laws was that if there was a problem with envelope B, um, we had to contact the voters and give them an opportunity to come in and fix the error or you know, the problem. So we would have contacted the voter if their envelope B had been slid open. None of us did that. Slid open envelope B. It was just the exterior, the exterior envelope. The voters vote that was that was inside the envelope right. B was sealed but the and that outer had envelope all information the right. outer envelope is also part of the security process is it not the outer envelope was slit open on days when we were having pre-processing and it was never done without other people present like the poll watchers or candidate uh, personnel we have teams of election officials who are sworn I understand that. I'm just trying to verify that the information I received is correct. They were opened without these other people. They were opened at some point, but they were left in the vault. But they, they you're interrupting me. The other people didn't get to see that. They did. So I want to, unless, for example, let's just say that the outer envelope was opened. Mm -hmm. Let's just say somebody decided to, you know, play some tricks and they took out envelope B. A, a couple of ones and they insert it into another open envelope, it wouldn't change the vote, it wouldn't change no. anything. It'd be the same. So I think what they're trying to say that whether or not the envelope, the outside envelope doesn't matter. It's the inside envelope that holds the secret ballot and has the, uh, and has the signature on the envelope B, correct? And that's how they mark off who voted. Uh, so there, that's not part of the security process that the outer envelope is part of that process. You could take all the outside envelopes and throw them away, and it wouldn't change the damn thing. It would be, you know, you'd No, it does change the thing because it, it changes it greatly because then you have no idea which went with what. As long as the envelope B is sealed, uh, th that would be just like somebody coming in in but, person and marking Ron, a ballot and something? handing it to you. Okay, when we get the envelopes back, Okay, that envelope has, and Kim, you, you know this process better than I do, and if you can address it in terms of how it's recorded and how we know who, who voted by absentee, I'm going to turn it over to you. You, you deal with that. Okay. <laughs> so, process. so absentee by mail ballots. Um, we mailed out ballots to voters who submitted applications. Um, they're entered into the state database. They're mail when we take them to mail them out, we have a certificate of mailing. We pay for that. The postmistress signs that she is accepting custody of that number of ballots and those people's ballots. Um, and we maintain that certificate of mailing in the office. When a voter votes their ballot and sends it back to us, we 
look at it, and you check it into the state database. So a voter couldn't, you know, get a ballot by mail and then go vote in Fairfax or whatever, statewide. They, we all use the same database, so that's not happening. Um, so we check them in, we check them off on the certificate of mailing and on the daily reports, and then we file them in the vault on shelves that correspond with the precincts in alphabetical order. They, even the exterior envelope is not opened until pre-processing. We don't open them and put them back in the vault or anything. That, that was the complaint, though, the, the, the person had remarked that they had no idea when the pre-processing was done. And why wouldn't the pre-processing be done in front of witnesses? The pre-processing, both political parties were notified. The political party that um, observed absolutely every step of this election, including LNA testing, including election day, including all of that, attended two of the pre-processing um, events, but not the third. I don't know why. So I can probably guess that the pre-processing was done in order to save time with an unprecedented amount of absentee yeah. ballots. And it, was, it was law. I mean, it's law now. Right. Yeah. How many ballots are we talking about? You mean by mail? The ones that are, that are the kind of complaint was made about. Oh. Each pre-processing session was, you know, either one or two precincts. So you're talking about, I mean, we have a lot less from several precincts that just don't. Um, we're talking maybe a couple hundred at the most. Uh, how much faster is it to cut an envelope open than it is to just reach in and pull it out? I mean, what, what do you use to cut it open with? Just a razor knife or something? Oh, that opener? We just did that. So if you want to talk about the pre-processing process, to, to reassure you, we had three election officials. We made them take the oath at every pre-processing um, session, just like they do on election day at the polling place. Um, both parties are represented by those election officials. And the pre-processing process, you know, the exterior envelope gets split open. An election official takes out an envelope, the checks to make sure the address written on there by the voter matches the address on the labels that we created when we process the applications. Um, they have a, what we call a bingo sheet that has numbers on it. Um, once they determine that, that that matches, the address matches, it's signed, it meets all the criteria established by the state, um, then that person splits open envelope B, takes the ballot out, unfolded, I mean, it's, it's still folded, and puts it in a plastic tote to maintain the privacy of the vote. After all of those envelopes have been processed, those ballots get unfolded and fed into the optical scanner, which we purchased specifically for pre-processing um, with CARES funds. But, um, there's also, they have to write the number on there, they have to initial it, and pass it on to the next election official. I mean, it's it's, it's very thorough and tedious process. And the exterior envelopes were not opened, you know, prior to a pre-processing. I mean, I sat in there a couple times and just slid open the up, outer envelope to make it faster for the other three to process them, because once you did that, and you had to feed them into the scanner, and then you had to fill out the statement of results, and then you had to, I mean, anyway. Is this something that if a board member wanted to come in and actually go through the process with you, Absolutely. simulated, they could do that, yeah. we could do that? that? That's why we just invited you again. Yeah. We, we've invited, by the way, the Board of Supervisors numerous times to come and see what we do, you know, at, at the registrar's office, and we really, we really, believe that it will help you and, and you'll understand how certain things fall into place. And we don't just do this helter skelter, this is by law. Right. And as I said, 69 new election laws were passed, plus directives. We can't do pre-processing, we are not allowed to slit open an envelope unless we've been given from the top down 
All right, the Virginia legislature is telling us that it's okay to do it. And so, I can assure you, none of us want to go to jail. I'm not say, saying you do, I just, I just don't really see, I mean, I'm pretty quick with a knife, even though I've never been in trouble with one, but <laughs> I, I think, I don't really think there's that much time saved by pre-slicing the envelope. Ron, please join us the next time, okay? I mean, that's all I can say to you. I'm, you're, I'm, you're, you're wasting a lot of time no, here. No, 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 no. Yes, it is. She, she's an election official who... I'm, I'm just, I had a complaint, and it's, it's my obligation to, to ask these questions. And if you don't like that or you get mad about it, I, I can't help right. that. I'm sorry. Right, and we, we also have another person. Ray Bach was also at pre-processing. He's been at the CAP for years. But my, right. my questions are for you today. Yes, I understand they, that. Um, but what we're trying to say to you is that there are fail-safe things that we can that we have done and that we I, that I understand that. I'm just that my two cents worth, envelope. if it's worth anything, is I don't think you saved much time by cutting an envelope open before people were there okay. to watch it. Then Ms. please Chandler. join us as an election official and we can put you in the cap next time. Ms. Chandler. I don't Thank think you. I can. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, Ron, um, I was at one of the, the pre-processing, and actually, I think Kim was actually splitting the envelope there at the time with the other two other election officials, and I was an uh, observer. And I think it did save time, and in fact, the three uh, individuals developed the system to make it go a little faster with, I mean, there are a lot of steps. I mean, they take it out. They have to sign it. They have to make sure the address, the return address, is the same as the inner envelope address. They have to read that out. It's on a registration form. That they have to then write out and say, yes, that's correct. You pass the test. Right? <laughs> then they slid open. Then they slid open the B after they confirm that those are actually the same name and confirm that, yes, it's on the voter roll. And then they throw them folded vote into a plastic bin and then they re they reinsert the envelope B into the return envelope so those stay together in alphabetical order and then once it's all done and they're counted to make sure that we have the right count every time something's done and then at the end and that for 150 votes that took two to three hours to do um, and then I wasn't there completely for the last part where they just, all they did was they just fed those, those things, the ballots in. There's, yeah, and then someone came in after me and did the same thing. Now, whether they saw Kim slip those open or not, or someone else, I, I don't know, but I can, I can say what I saw. Thank you. Um, and, I mean, and if that was something... Uh, that was allowed as part of the legislation or the guidance because of the high number of mail-in votes or absentee votes. If, if you have a concern about that, then I would bring that forward. But I'm, I'm relaying a, a yeah. concern from somebody else. So, And I really don't think people should get upset because it, it, the questions are asked. I think we should uh, go in and take a look next time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Miss Donnie, I did have just two questions, um, and not to put you on the spot, how many registered voters were there in the last election in Rappahannock County? 6,107. How many people voted? 4,962. 4, 952. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, 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 yeah. so 4,972 ballots were cast. There were still, in the over 5,000 lives, there were still 59 ballots that we, that that voters had applied for, we mailed to them, they didn't mark and return them, and they didn't show up at the polls. Okay. But we still went through the process of... All right. So, so, so we're well short of 100%, and by no means did more than 100% of registered voters vote, which one person noted um, a citizen at our last meeting. Okay. Right, say that again? The I math works. Not more than 100% of registered no, voters voted. It was not. And may I say something? That was the same person that complained to Ron Frazier about... Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I just, want to I just want to confirm the numbers. Any Thank other you. questions? I think we probably should move on. For sure. Mr. Bach had his hand up. Yeah. This one again, Tom jumped in and I'm on the 
collection. And the process she described, and we had observers around this, uh, the electoral board, both parties uh, walked in and out during our process, and that's it. So we had plenty of observers to make sure that it was okay. And when we had questions, we asked him for the needs to learn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Mr. Curry, I, I do have one administrative question. I believe that we, we asked the electoral board folks and Ms. Kiernan to come in because uh, last year we did um, we did adopt as our minutes the, um, I believe it's, it's called the uh, you recorded the abstract of votes, right? Yeah. Within your records, right? Is that still an outstanding administrative item? We need to. You did do that. At your we last did. Time. Okay, I, I lost track of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next on the uh, presentations is the Black Kettle Commons presentation. Everybody okay, or do we need a break? Well, we will. Just, uh, Madam Chairman, I just did want to mention we will need a break for the. Um, present some things uh, toward the end of the presentation. Yep. And so we'll do one right just before to that. take care of a few signatures. Okay. But other than that, gotcha. Thank you. Mr. Opry. Thank you all for asking us to uh, talk a little bit about this project we have called uh, the Ravenna Commons at the present time. And it is on nine acres of ground at the corner of Warren Avenue and 211. It is uh, a little bit more of the land is in the county and, and a little bit less of the land is in the, in the town of Washington. And uh, I would say right off the bat that it, there are people in the county who believe that it's the most valuable site of land, piece of land in Ravana County because it's at that intersection zone commercial and a lot could be done on that property. We, we are effectively downgrading the use uh, in what we're trying to do. It's also a very difficult prop, prop piece of property to site to, to work because of the streams and the wetlands. And our goal has always been from the outset to make the streams and the wetlands a, a principal uh, component of the, of the development of the land. We, um, the first thing we did after my wife and I bought the property from the Laphams in just about a year ago in December 2019, and um, we had no idea what we were going to do with it when we bought it. So I started on a uh, campaign to just begin to ask people around the community what they would like to see on that property. Um, that went into high gear once it became known that the food pantry was having some difficulty with the site they'd selected. And um, we offered them a, um, a pretty attractive deal where we would give them a location on that ground at no cost to them, and we would bring uh, the utilities to that site at no cost to them, and we would rent it to them for a dollar a year for a very long period of time. Um, so that is the only handshake agreement we have on the site. We've assembled a team of, uh, of outstanding people to, to help us put this project together. It starts first with, with Betsy Deedle, who's been right, my right-hand man, and make everything happen that we've done so far. We uh, assembled a, an architectural firm called Gensler. The principal member of that firm has a house here in Rappahannock County in Flint Hill area. And uh, we've hired Ma Michael Ferguson, landscape architecture firm out of Alexandria. Uh, we have in the room here John Foote, who is a land use lawyer in Northern Virginia from Walsh Colucci, and Stephen Plesko, who's a civil engineer who has a firm in Culpeper called St. Ma's. We put this team together to help us plan in conjunction uh, with the community what we, what we would like to see on this property and what the community would like to see in this property. And in that regard, um, we've held over, over 50 direct personal meetings. A lot of people in this room have, have come and had a chance to, to see what we're, we're, we're thinking about doing. And on the, on the screen here, you can see what they call a bubble diagram. And those places in the yellow are, are items that, that are possibilities to go in this site. Nothing is fixed right now, but just generally speaking, what we would like to see on the site divided into sort of three pieces. The piece on the farthest right is the, is the highest, highest point of the land, and it's 
the 211 and Warren Avenue corridor. Uh, we would like to see a, a community center up there, quite possibly in association with the library, who is considering that as a location to move to. That is completely out, out of our, we have nothing to do with that decision. Um, we would also like to do some some um, office space in that area that, that could accommodate not-for-profits as well as for-profit businesses that would like to be there. Down at the side of the old motel is an area where we think we can have about 10 to 20 housing units, which would be a mixture of, of housing for seniors as well as is housing for, for young families and so on. Uh, again, they would be rental houses. Um, and then down towards the front of the property, right across from where the post office is, is being uh, assembled right now, is where the food pantry and some other, um, other services, which may include, um, may include a clinic, it may include the health department, it may include um, uh, social services, that's still up in the air as most of this is, but we're moving forward. The, um, the site does not have sewer and water at, at the site. There Actually, there is water at the site, but in order to accommodate any of those uses, we have to uh, have sewer and water, otherwise the project won't go forward. The town and the town's council has made it clear to us that, that they, will not, uh, they will not offer sewer and water to property which is in the county, and only if it's in the town. And so accordingly, our plan is to um, present the town and the county with an application for a board, for a boundary line adjustment, BLA, uh, in, the, in sometime in the next few months. We're, we're putting that together. And they're on our website called Black Kettle Commons, you can see a, a, a description of what's involved in, the, in, in going through the boundary line adjustment. We want to be and have been, we think, fully transparent in what it is we're trying to do there. That is, a, that is our family's gift to the county. Um, you know, many projects I've started in my life have been ones where I anticipated making a profit in, in, and sometimes did, but this is not a project where I have that in mind. It, it is, a, it is a, in effect, our, our gift to the county and the town um, for, for a common ground meeting place, and, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. I see this uh, cafe little spot down here. Are you going to offer free coffee to supervisors? <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds like an opportunity for a bribe, doesn't it? <laughs> um, I will say that there was an earlier comment about concern about lighting. Um, that we've had people come and address that issue with us. We're fully cognizant of it and, and expect to have lighting in the, and have the architects involved in that already. But expect to have lighting that will fully comply with dark skies and so on. And uh, um, Madam Mr. Chair, Wilson? if I may. Yep. Um, Mr. Octor, thank, thank you very much for waiting two and a half or hour and a half, whatever it was, to, to speak with us. Mm -hmm. We appreciate it. Um, I did have a few questions, and um, some of them might be tough questions to answer on the spot, but certainly you can follow up. Um, mm -hmm. And in full transparency, I have met with your group and you've met, I believe, with all my colleagues. So some of these questions are repeats, but I think it's important for further transparency um, that the public at least hear um, concerns from where I sit as sure. the representative of the Hampton Voting District. Um, when you purchased the property from the Laphams, you said that you really didn't know what you're going to do with it. That's correct. Um, Maybe it's a, an unanswerable philosophical question. Why did you purchase the property if you didn't know what you would do with it? Um, you know, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, thought, I thought it represented an opportunity, but I didn't know what it was. I okay. thought okay. it was something that was manageable. I mean, it's my understanding that, that Nick and Gardner and others bought that property ultimately from John Coles or by through an intermediary and, and has, has protected the county and the town by keeping that undeveloped, as it were, for a long time. And they should be applauded for that, I think, in terms of yeah. keeping the quality of the community as it is, right? Um, one concern I've heard from constituents, um, particularly in light of a, a newspaper article regarding a possible development of that old mill property, which is yes. not part of your properties, is that this this might somehow be the start of precedent for 
further, and I know it's not a word I'm supposed to use, but further annexation or, or, or grabbing of county property and pulling it into the town. Yeah. Is this related in any way to the mill property? It is that not. About? There's no relationship whatsoever. Okay. And then there was a separate pop property on Fire Sack Road that I understand certain people involved in your project either purchased or owned. Is, so there is, is a, that there's, the a, there's, a, there's a, an entirely different group called Ravenna Communities, okay. which owns the old church property on Fodder Stack Road. It's unrelated to this altogether. Mm. Both Betsy Deedle and I are, 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 are part of Ravenna Communities, part of the founding group of that. Okay. And you heard from at least one citizen today during the public comment period, and, and um, I've expressed my concern um, about this. Um, fundamentally, we're talking about a boundary line adjustment that would bring a portion of one of two properties that are part of the total nine acres into the town. If if doing math, if I'm doing the math correctly, it's maybe three acres. No, the, the county's part is over five acres. It is over five acres. Okay, yeah. and that property though is bisected by the town and county line, correct? Correct. And I believe, and it might not be something you can answer, but I understand from talking to other property owners with similar properties around the town that are split by a town county boundary, that in the past the town has in fact off, in fact offered them a sewer hookup if at least a portion of the property was within the town, even if the whole property might not be. And so my question to you is, um, thinking of some of the sensitivity of citizens' concern that you would be effectively bringing county land into the town through a boundary line adjustment, the application for which is pending, um, why could you not work with the town to ask them to extend sewer service to that split property and avoid the discussion of boundary line adjustment altogether? Well, we've asked the, the town mayor as well as the town council specifically if they would do that, and they said they would not. Okay. And, um, Madam Chair, I think... It, and, by the way, as it relates to the sewer and water, our house is in the town. Uh, our house in, in the village is in the town, and um, we have town water, but we do not have town sewer. Okay. It is not offered to us or the prior owners. Okay. Uh, and Madam Chair, I think it would be important as a follow-on to this presentation for us to hear from the mayor and perhaps a member of the town council because I think it's critical that we understand sure. from them what you they've been It's saying. logical. Yeah, we need to understand but what the, this but the property is. cannot be developed really yeah. logically without sewer and water. Okay. That's um, pretty clear. So if the town were to And by the way, the BLA is not is is not in process already as you mentioned. Okay. Well, pending, I think. Pending. Yeah, you you mentioned well, So it's not even pending yet. We haven't presented Fair enough. Right. And right. And then um if the town if the town could be convinced to extend sewer and water to that split parcel would you then be able to do what you want to do on that property? Well, the town actually has a PUD ordinance, which gives, which is a plan unit development ordinance, which from a zoning point of view gives us the flexibility to put a bunch of different uses, housing, commercial, retail, whatever, on the property. And, and that does not uh, exist currently in the county. Okay. And so we would be hamstrung to that extent in our ability to move forward. Um, you mentioned rental properties. Um, you're talking about possibly 10 or 20 units. Yes. Um, where would the revenue from, where would the rental income from those units go? Um, you mentioned this isn't, obviously, it seems anything more than a gift that you and, and Mrs. Ocker are providing to the community. Right. Is that revenue going somewhere so else? So there'll be, there'll be some revenue on the properties uh, because it will all be land that's leased. Um, and so there'll be some revenues on the property that will help cover the expenses of operating the property, and there may be excess cash flow. There may not be. Okay. All right. So it sounds. I mean, I, I do want to say thank you because, um, as you describe it, it sounds like this is truly a gift. Is that? Well, is, we we intended to be that. Yeah, and huh? and you have there's no you have no other economic interest in I, it. Other I don't. Than, no. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Madam Chairman, I got a, a question for the county administrator. The uh, the food pantry and the library. Do we collect real estate tax on the library? No. How about food pantry? I can't answer that. Uh, likely not. Okay. Because they're in a rental space now, so I think. Right. Uh, right. It depends on what the ownership is and. Right. 
We'll work so with we would sure. collect real estate tax on the on the ten or twenty houses. We would collect real estate tax on the office building, correct? Should it, yeah, you know, of course right. those are discussions the Commissioner of Revenue would work through relative to the Code of Virginia and the right. established um, uses that are exempt, or there are other uses that can be applied for, and the board right. would have to designate yeah. them to be exempt. I'm just trying to see what the ramifications are uh, of giving up land to the town. I know the town would keep all food and lodging uh, tax, which looks to me like would only relate to the little cafe. But uh, but we but we would collect all the real estate tax of property that's in the town. So I'm just trying to figure out, you know, the the uh, what that would amount to. More or less, but it seems like it'd be pretty substantial. Yeah, so I think it's it, you know it, it, it has the opportunity to be a substantial economic win for the county as compared to today. Today, I mean, you're getting very little tax on that ground right now, right. and to put that whole nine acres to use at a re substantially reduced density than is allowed for, um, you know, and have, having the land be owned by a third party, which ultimately probably be a not-for-profit, but, um, you know, that, that produces revenue as well, tax revenue as well in all likelihood. I had a very similar project in my last community where uh, a trust purchased the shopping center, developed it, uh, and then leased back to the community uh, what was a grocery store to be the library. And the trust held the property and the revenue from the properties, including property taxes, as part of the rent went towards the maintenance of the property going right. forward. Right. Any excess was then invested into the Main Street because it was a Main Street Preservation right. Trust. Um, Mr. Ockery, and I don't know if you want to answer this or perhaps Mr. Foote, um, let's, let's just say the town and the county can't reach an agreement on a boundary line right. announcement. You raise the issue that it's, it's secondly, not only sewer and water, but it's also the zoning designation of right. parcels absent uh, planned unit development zoning designation, does that make this then a non-starter? Probably so. And why is that? Just because the ability to put these things together on the property that we like to do for the community. I mean, I don't want to develop this, which is it allowed for under the commercial zoning currently. You know, uh, right. that's not my intention. Right. Okay. Madam Chair? Yes. I guess I had a follow-up question if you could, sure. Mr. Eckery. Um, could you, would you be in a position today to address the, uh, and, it, and it is widespread, even though it's, I think it was only mentioned once today during public comment, what's in it for the county residents? Well, we just talked about that. I know, but uh, we already have a park, so the uh, community part of it is, is really... Uh, well, what's in it for the county, from my perspective, is that opportunity for a substantially greater real estate taxes than it's getting currently. Well, that doesn't always hurt, but again, the average citizen isn't looking at that. They're looking at development and what development might bring. Well, certainly the county would, would could get a much higher economic return from that if it were developed as it's presently zoned commercially. And that opportunity has been there for a long time. Well, there's a lot of properties like that that just haven't been developed. Uh, so I, I guess what's in it for the county is is kind of a rhetorical question. I mean, what, what what's in it for the county government? What's in it for the average citizen? So we we already had concerns uh, about the uh, the lighting. Once it goes into the the town boundaries, the county has no say on what type of lighting project you use. No, but I mentioned that we've already addressed that with the people who brought that up with us. Architects are already on board with that, and we're. For them. And the, the prior speaker said that our LEP would was willing to consult with us in the lighting. We're happy to do that, and and we're happy to proffer that. I mean, it makes it makes good a, sense to me. They're not a governmental entity, and the board would be out of it after that. Well, I couldn't answer that. I don't understand that necessarily. And the food pantry that is a must. Um, yeah, they have to be out by. Right, they are, they are, their lease ends, I think, this year, 2021. Um, and they have some ability to move it beyond that, but but um, yes. You know, and the they, communi 
community gathering, is that just an outside amphitheater? Well, no, so we, yeah, we, we had, we, yeah, we planned to have that as a, a building itself um, that could seat maybe 100, 150 people inside. Um, my, my own view is that people like to get together when there's food involved. <laughs> And, uh, and so maybe there's a commercial kitchen associated with that meeting rooms or meeting space that could be attached to the library. Um, those are all the things. And then outside, going down towards the stream would be an outside amphitheater of a fairly modest proportion. But yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, and this is John Foote. Madam Chair, Mr. Um, we've all met. I'm John Foote, Walsh Colucci. Let me add a couple of thoughts to that. The first of which would be that in addition to just the mere tax revenue, one of the things that we have discussed internally uh, is that it is possible through a boundary line adjustment to do such things as to discuss revenue share. Uh, and so in addition to just the tax revenue, to the extent there is revenue that's generated from the, from the development of the property, then there could be in the boundary line adjustment an agreement to share revenue, such as if there were any significant revenue, for example, under the food tax that might be done, that could absolutely be part of an agreement reached between the county and the town, which would increase the revenue to the county beyond what some increase in revenue would be. The other thing that we discuss with, with, have, we discuss with others is, right now you have a, shall we say, not too attractive piece of ground sitting at that corner, which is a signal piece of property for both jurisdictions. We're talking about turning it in, we, this is the royal we, you know, not me, I'm Chuck. Talking about turning it into a garden spot which would be beneficial just as a mere fact of life for the communities. The other thing, Mr. Fraser, uh, Madam Chairman, is something that was brought up during our discussions, and that is, I believe you realize there are a couple of easements that have been placed on properties that have been considered a bit friction-laden between the jurisdictions. And we're prepared to discuss with the town the removal of those restrictions and we've had some reason to believe that the town might be willing to do that. And I know that the county has a piece of ground in the town that it might like to make better use of, and that might be something that we can accomplish through this process. And if that would be something that's of benefit and use to the county, that's something that would also be of benefit and that we could be the facility for. So we suggest to you there are things in this that are not even fully fleshed out yet, but that we believe can be part and parcel of what we accomplish as part of what Chuck and his family are trying to do for both jurisdictions. Well, Mr. Foote, thank you for that. Thank you, you. As, as you are aware, there are certain things that local governments really aren't supposed to be talking about, and you've already addressed a couple of them, so that's a good thing. Well, and, and we can, and the other thing I can suggest, Madam Chairman, is that because of the nature of zoning, conditional zoning, special use permits, there are things to which commitment can be made that you can pick up a piece of paper and see, including the boundary line adjustment agreement that we'll work out with Mr. Goff, Mr. Curry, Mr. Bennett, the mayor, all of which will have to be part of a public process in, the, in this end. that have to do, be done through public hearings. There is no such thing as under the radar boundary line adjustments and zoning. It doesn't exist. So this will all be things that people see, hear, can talk about, can yell at us about. Uh, I would also say, for example, that one of, the one of the reasons that we would like to do the boundary line adjustment is because it, it is conceivable that were we to be able to get utilities from the town, that the county zoning ordinance could be used sufficiently to accomplish what we want, but it makes planning for it as a unified development more difficult. It simply does. Looking as, as Mr. Pleskow back here as a planner, as well as an engineer, me as a land use lawyer, believes it is much easier to do these things if we do them with a unified zoning ordinance in a single jurisdiction. It's just simpler to do. All of the development is going to have to go through the Architectural Review Board in the, in the town. All of it has to go through a process that you too will be advised, uh, participating in because of the statute that requires all of those things to be provided to jurisdictions within a half a mile. You're a lot closer than that. So this will not be any secret to anybody. And so there are ways that Mr. Ockery is going to have to make commitments in this process of which you will be aware. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, right. Madam Chair, I just want to emphasize we do need to, we do need to, sorry to keep you up there, we do need to hear from the town. So if we can make sure that at our, at our next meeting yep. 
that they come prepared to talk to us about what they're willing to do and not willing to do or unable to do from a sewer and water perspective that would help inform our decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. If, I'm sorry to interject, but it is uh, one of the bubbles on the bubble diagram. Is there any available update on the post office? <laughs> oh, sorry. Well, it's a little muddy. Oh, yeah. I've got nothing That's, to do with the post office. Yeah, okay. I just see that it's wet. <laughs> it's on the diagram, so I thought I would ask. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> it's very, yeah, it's muddy. All right, Mr. Mr. Curry, Mr. Curry do much. we have Mr. Nesbitt on the line? Yes, Mr. Nesbitt is uh, been patiently waiting, I presume, on yes. Zoom. If you're ready to move to that, I can ask him to unmute his mic. Yes, please. And thank you, Mr. Nesbitt, for waiting. And he's now live. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, uh, and congratulations to for your own paper uh, election. Uh, yeah, we're asked to, uh, to, to do the uh, quarterly update today, and uh, glad to do that. Uh, we should have a copy of the uh, package. Um, and uh, you're welcome to answer any questions uh, you, know, uh, you may have. I'm going to bring it forward. I'm just going to take the high points that I think, that I think are the high points, but uh, you know, anything that you don't have, I'll be able to try to answer. Um, the, uh, the, one of the high points, uh, obviously, is the uh, we did complete the uh, bridge uh, deck replacement on the um, Kaiser Run Road uh, Bridge uh, back in December that was closed for uh, several weeks, um, actually two to three months, about three months. And, uh, and it was open uh, on time and, and on budget. It was a state force project and uh, happy to have that bridge replaced, uh, bridge deck replaced and uh, most of the traffic. Um, the uh, South Pose uh, Rural Rustic Road Project yeah, um, last, last year, the board and supervisors voted to keep that project moving forward in the uh, six-year plan, so that project is still underway. Uh, we're going to you know, be working that project through the winter months. It probably won't accomplish uh, uh, a lot, but we'll get done what we can uh, when we can, and uh, we hope to complete that project in the summer of uh, like 2021. The, uh, also, I think last month, December, we discussed, uh, have had some communication with uh, Mr. Curry on the uh, Route 637 North uh, section, the bridge replacement over Jericho River, which is a... Uh, jo Jordan River. Jordan River, excuse me, that's hard. Um, which is a, uh, it's a trust, existing trust bridge. We're going to be replacing that, uh, that, that, uh, that, that trust that was um, actually built in 19, uh, uh, 1935, I believe, is what we determined. And um, there were some questions about the historical significance of the bridge, and we, uh, our uh, research council did the, their research, and, and uh, the bridge did not meet the criteria for inclusion in the historic uh, register, so uh, we're, we're going to proceed with that project as the board uh, 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 yeah, yeah, for you. Questions regarding that, we're certainly happy to answer that. Uh, um, and um, we, uh, in, in all, uh, address some of the, I know, uh, 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 Chairwoman's, uh, not Chairwoman, uh, uh, Mr. Smith has some questions about, Chairperson Smith has some questions about Stairville traffic, and I'll update, uh, update on that in a second. Uh, we did receive an inquiry to review the speed limit on Aaron Mountain Road, which is Route 622, and we're in the process of doing that, and uh, we'll have results of that here uh, probably in the next few weeks. Um, yeah, we've been, you know, this is the beginning of, or in the, in the winter months, so we're Constantly uh, getting, um, having to mobilize for um, weather activities. We did have a fairly significant snow uh, back in, in mid December, which I'm sure everyone remembers, and um, we mobilized for that. We've also had to mobilize on a number of occasions for ice and 
icy situations, most notably in the Chester Gap area and also up on Route 11, uh, Skyline, uh, Skyline Drive. Uh, so we're busy uh, uh, tracking weather issues and weather concerns. Um, those, those are the main points. Um, uh, you know, our, um, you know, I do have on there the rural rock for us at Center development. Those are basically what's in the six-year plan, and we will be pursuing those uh, at, yeah, in, in order as the dates come up. Um, so, uh, if there are any um, any questions on any of that, I'd be happy to answer them, and or I could you know, give you the uh, Sperryville traffic update. I have a question quickly. Any update on the speed study for Woodville? Or Woodville. Oh, uh, but yes, we did that and determined that, I thought I had forwarded that to you. We did determine that the, uh, the existing 35 mile an hour speed zone was appropriate. We got concurrence from the state police and the county sheriff's office. So that, that, uh, that speed zone will, will stay as it is. Thank you. That's great news. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Uh, Madam Chair, the Sturryville I... Main right. Street or Sturryville area uh, traffic items that we've been reviewing with uh, uh, Chairperson Smith are um, there, were, there were a number of items, uh, some that, that, that were quality had responsibility for initiating, and some that the that, that VDOT was going to under, undertake. Uh, uh, and I'll, I'll address, I guess I'll, I'll list them all and then we'll address the, you know, where, where they are at. Uh, and uh, I'm using this, uh, the uh, document, uh, Ms. Smith, that you sent me via email. It's basically uh, an updated list that you sent me uh, several weeks ago. Um, I don't know if the board has that or not. I, did, uh, I, I didn't send it to the board, but. Uh, uh, I'll just go down to these, these items. The Rappahannock Public School System uh, is going to review school bus stops in the area and make, make requests to be out on, on problematic uh, school bus stop locations on, uh, in this very real area. Uh, I have not heard, heard from anyone on that yet, so we are awaiting that communication. Um, also, the uh, children at play signs, uh, looking at locations that uh, the, the county may uh, request and, and, uh, and pursue uh, the children at play signs, and that's a process where they are uh, with the county would get a, 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 a permit from the from BDOT to install them and, and, uh, and put those signs up. Um, also, the purchase of uh, mobile uh, speed feedback signs for uh, speeding uh, in the area and uh, I think the county uh, the county is going to pursue, pursue that as well and uh, we would yeah, work with the county on that. Um, there was a stop sign there at Woodward Wood Street and Main Street that was covered by vegetation the uh, had that removed um, uh, had the vegetation removed not the, not the stop sign. Um, and we will, uh, the, uh, there was a, uh, the ongoing uh, concern with the sidewalk on Main Street and uh, pedestrian safety with the sidewalk uh, you know, adjacent to the travel lane. And we are going to install an 8 inch wide thermoplastic um, paint marking along that uh, edge. Uh, we already have an edge line, but it is faded. Uh, we're going to replace that or cover that with an 8 inch thermoplastic marking, which is um, a thicker, more uh, visible marking. Uh, unfortunately, it's very temperature sensitive. We can't install that until we'll, we'll install that as soon as uh, it warms up. So if we do get a break uh, in temps, temperature during the winter months, we can, but typically you won't. Uh, you know, 50, 60 degree weather to install that. And, and if we find a gap where we can install it, we will, we will try to get that done before, before spring, but most likely it will be spring. Um, let's see, also, um, we were looking, uh, the county was interested, or Smith was interested in uh, radar enforced uh, signs. Um, like uh, we have in Woodville, and traffic engineer is, is reviewing that, and I hope to have a, a more uh, a, a, a 
more um, a better report on that. That they haven't provided me any specific recommendations on that yet. I know that they're looking at it, and um, by, by next month, I can include that in, a, in, a, in the report as far as the status of that. Um, and uh, the next item was the, the, uh, the crosswalk at the intersection of 522 and Main Street, where we had, we had a crosswalk with a number of, uh, the number of signs at that, that intersection, very kind of busy intersection with signs and a crosswalk. And recently, we issued a permit, I think we, we've been coordinating with the county with uh, Mr. Curry to issue a permit for the uh, the pavement uh, mounted sign right there in the, in the median of uh, Main Street, a little small paddle type sign uh, that has been, been there for uh, several months. But uh, we are looking at, uh, we're going to install um, pedestrian crossing sign, warning signs at the intersection that are the large uh, signs that are um, standard height that will be on each side of the intersection to provide uh, the, you know, a, a more visible uh, Warning to motors that they can be seen, you know, uh, at a distance. So that will, well, I've been told that was four to six weeks away, and that, that, that is in the works. Um, and uh, so the other item was that there, on, on Woodward, Woodward Road, in advance of the intersection with uh, Main Street, there was a truck route sign. Uh, as, we, as you know, the uh, Main Street is, has a truck prohibition on it. A three truck prohibition on it, so there were, were signs on the approaches, uh, and the sign on Woodward Road had been uh, knocked down for some time actually, and so they have re erected that sign. Uh, some of you may have noticed that that has been done, and also, uh, and, and one other issue uh, request, I guess, is the uh, addition of bicycle signs, bicycle warning signs on Route 411 on Shenandoah. Parkway, and uh, we, we just need to get with, uh, you know, look at exactly where we want to put those, um, you know, whether uh, on the uh, on the approach we can uh, make a recommendation of, of, of where they should go, but they're, they're checking the criteria for that, and we will follow up in the next couple of weeks with uh, more specifics on the bicycle signs. That's, um, that's great. Thank you, Mr. Nesbitt. I appreciate your following up on those items. Ms. Yeah, in preparing, I did notice that we did do a speed study on Main Street back in 2018, in the summer of 2018, and uh, the uh, 85th percentile is uh, just shy of 30, uh, 30 miles per hour, you know, as opposed to the 25. Uh, so the 85th was, was 30, and uh, the 80 feet on Main Street is, 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 is 1,200. Uh, vehicles a day is the, the current most recently on, on the main street. Thank you, Mr. Nesbitt. And uh, Mr. Whitson has something for you. Hi, Mr. Nesbitt. Um, first of all, I want to thank you. I, I went to visit some constituents yesterday on Mount Marshall Road, Route 625 off of um, Harris Hollow Road. And to my surprise, your Rappahannock County team um, actually paved the apron there. So thank you to Mr. Jenkins, his team, and to you for following up on that. Um, I, I also heard from my constituents that the that there was some culvert cleaning that was completed um, to the terminus of the road. Do you have any details about what was actually done? Um, they were there apparently for more than a day. I just wanted to make sure I could report back to folks who live on that road what has been done. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure that that is. I mean, I'm, I've actually got my... Uh I got my email up. I can pull that up. I do recall that they did uh, clean up some pipe. I don't think they replaced pipe, but let me pull that up. And um, um, I remember when that when you requested that. And um, yeah, there was a large culvert almost to the terminus of the road that was problematic. I just want to make sure that was taken care of. Yeah. Uh, now Marshall. Yeah. Six twenty five, I believe. Yeah. Sorry to put you on the spot. Okay. I'm fortunate I'm sitting here at my computer and I can pull it Yeah. 
Yes, the, uh, Yeah, I think he must have told me that probably because it's not in the email, but uh, he did say that there were, you know, there were driveway pipes. That, uh, okay. I'll, I'll drive it and I'll follow up with you if needed. Yeah, I can sort of follow up with that and I'll see yep. you in the email. But the apron looks great and I appreciate that. Um, our favorite road, Long Mountain Road. Um, actually, while I was sitting here, I got an email from some residents there. Uh, a grader went through it, I believe, between Christmas and New Year's, and then I think we had that, that rain event, ice event. Um, it looks like it's already in bad shape. Again, I'm referring specifically, I think, to the uphill from rock mills going up to ridgeview um i wonder if, if you could contact mr jenkins and if somebody could meet me out there this week to take a look at it um it also needs gravel um in addition to regrading yeah that's that's no problem i can do that um, and then and then finally i want to thank you for uh, the one property owner in the hampton voting district who had some work that needed to be done within your right away. I really appreciate your, your following up and getting that done. And thank you to Mr. Jenkins and his team. I'll pass that on to him. Yep. So let me know when we could meet some, somebody could meet me at Long Mountain. Sure. Yeah. I will get back to you shortly. All this. right. Thank you. Any other board members before I speak? No. Mr. Nesbitt, um, I am just trying to follow up. Uh, PEC is still interested in uh, the Jordan River Bridge. Uh, I received an email that said they're still looking into um, the historic registration on it. So just a heads up for you that um, you may get more questions. Also, I'm wondering, I saw a bunch of uh, trucks around uh, at least Wakefield today that appear to be cutting ash trees. Is that part of your work yeah we have a uh, we have a contractor that um that we use as contracted by our district roadside folks uh but uh yeah we are having a as they don't know a, a, a terrible problem with the ash tree uh, the ash borer and so uh, if they were cutting trees on the uh within the right of way it was, i'm sure it was probably our contractor doing that and uh, we're, we're having to do that all over Actually, it's a statewide and a regional issue, uh, but uh, yeah, we're uh, we're having to do that uh, fairly regularly now. It will be an ongoing problem for a while. I appreciate you doing that. I've heard it's uh, slightly dangerous to cut into an ash tree, so I, I'm glad you have your professional crews doing it. Right, we 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 learned uh, that that's a that is a uh, it is a specialty, and uh, if you don't know what you're doing, it can be very dangerous. Miss Donna, I had one question I forgot, and I I never imagined I'd have to ask this. Um, Route 624 Sunnyside Road, which intersects with Harris Hall Road, some beavers have transient beavers have taken up residence downstream of the Sunnyside Road Bridge, and it's it's um, pretty pretty significant flooding there, and the the roadbed is barely above now where the water has moved um, from the damming of the beavers. And um, I'm going to talk t as soon as possible with the property owner who owns the interior away from the roadside of, of um, that section of the Rush River. But what, um, what have you done in the past in similar situations? Would it be a, a relocation? Because I, I think it's gonna create an acute flooding problem pretty soon. Yes, we uh, typically if there's a beaver issue, beaver dam issue that's going to impact the roadway, we, we contact the federal the Department of Agriculture and they have uh, they have a uh, contract uh, with beaver service and that's just that's the way our environmental folks uh, okay. are required to utilize them. And so uh, we we'll, we can take we can investigate that and yeah, I will, and I worry about the springtime. I mean, it's gotten worse and worse. Um, so I just I want to talk to the landowners and let them know that their pet beavers are probably going to have to go somewhere else. Yeah, anytime you have any of those types of issues, you can let me know. Yep. Okay. okay, thank you. I'll follow up with you after I talk with them. Okay, that sounds good. Sorry. That's okay. Anybody else? 
Mr. Nesbitt, just thank you for being here and uh, appreciate how quickly you uh, get to the issues that we all have in our districts. I know it's it's really important to our citizens. Madam Chair, point of order, could you ask the people to silence their phones? Thank you. Yeah. Somebody's dinging. Who's got the ding? <laughs> all right. I I say, I'm sorry, I just, if I knew it was you, I would have just said, could you stop the dinging, room. please? Anything else, Mr. Nesbitt? He's gone. Okay. Okay. I think we should take a five minute break and we'll Thank come you. back to the um, four and five under presentation. Thank you. If you put them in the sink. Uh, I guess the torch gets passed to some new people. Uh, relatively few people are entrusted with the feeling and uh, <clears throat> with the future of our county and protecting it. Uh, and uh, as you look around, uh, we've done, as a group, a pretty good job. And so now the burden is on <coughs> Mr. Whitson and your colleagues on the Planning Commission to continue that work and to preserve this place. And one person that I also forgot to mention is Phil Irwin, uh, who, as many others have said, was somebody that you could always turn to and talk to and get some advice from maybe great you missed. And, uh, so anyway, mostly I wanted to just say it's a real privilege to serve the county and to give something back. And uh, thank you all very much, and thank you for the certificate and the time for it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that moves us into appointments. And the first is the Library Board of Trustees. Mr. Curry, do you want to help us on this one? Uh, yes, uh, as you're aware, uh, the uh, Library Board of Trustees um, is fixed pursuant to Rappahannock County Code Section 123-3. It includes nine members of which uh, one may be a county representative, and I fill that role for the county. Uh, there are currently, as of December 31, three uh, vacancies on the board. Uh, of those three, uh, one member uh, has uh, decided not to put their name forward for reappointment, and two have requested reappointment. You may recall that your, your uh, somewhat new policy on appointments has different forms for appointment and reappointment, and you'll see those in the attachments. Uh, Ms. Sidro and Ms. Shoemate have filed Form 810A, while uh, Ms. Peterson, Mr. Timperlake, uh, Mr. Kalen, Ms. Welch, and Ms. Dr. Burnley have filed Form 810B. Uh, so before you tonight is a, a, a rather large slate from which to make three appointments. I'm not sure, Madam Chair, how you want to do it, but I'd like to place uh, Ms. Sidro's name back in uh, nomination for reappointment. Uh, she's the only member from Jackson District and the only one that applied from Jackson District. Do these require seconds? So uh, these are, I'll just say, typically you make an appointment through a, full, a motion, so a oh, motion, okay. second vote. Uh, you could somehow develop a pool of candidates if that worked out, where you could make friendly amendments to each other's motions, or you can make separate motions and separate votes. So, uh, Mr. Frazier, would you motion? be willing to, uh, <clears throat> with Ms., along with uh, Ms. Sidro, uh, Peterson, and Welch, would have that as a slate, uh, and we do it all at one time? And in an effort to save time? Uh, I was uh, just trying to keep some sort of balance. Uh, looks like we have a hole in Piedmont as well. We don't have a citizen rep from there, that, that right. district. Other, other than that, I don't have any favoritism. Um, Ms. Harris, I believe. Yes, Ms. Piedmont Harris is from Piedmont. But, it, I mean, it would be nice to have a second, to be sure. I, I was wondering, none of the applicants are present, I, I assume. It doesn't look like any of the applicants are present. Um, our, our Madam Chairman, I was also wondering if any of the applicants are online and, and would like to say anything or are willing to answer questions. None of the applicants are online. Um, if you want to put the other form of motion, maybe we could do it one by one. That may be the best way to do it. Well, yeah, I, I did that as a form of a motion. Okay. I'll, I'll second the reappointment of Ms. Sidra. 
And um, to, be, to be clear, this is a, a four-year term uh, pursuant to your code. Okay. Any Great. discussion? I know that we are probably very fortunate. I know that we are very fortunate to have this pool of clearly qualified candidates for these positions. It's three positions, which is a large portion of this board. Um, from the library board meeting that I attended this year, there's a lot going on on the library board. Mm -hmm. And while the statements we received from the candidates are very nice, um, I would like to know how they stand on certain things that are going on at the library currently before I make any appointments to the library board. Um, in particular, I noted that the library had closed for the entire month of January, and I know some of the folks that live in my district really depend on the library for its resources, especially in the very cold weather, um, for their internet connection. And I'd like to know where our appointees stand on that. We also heard today a pitch regarding a large project that would require a boundary line adjustment that would involve the library. And I'd like to know where the appointees stand on that. I think this is a very active board and I have questions about all the appointees. And I would, I'm, I'm not comfortable making these appointments today. And, and if the majority of the board feels that they are comfortable and have a good grasp on these issues, um, we probably should move forward. But I see the potential to spend a lot of money with this board. And I would like to know the mindset of the, of the people that we're appointing. Ms. Ms. Smith, would it be your proposal that we, at our next regular meeting then we, we hear from each of them so that we can make an informed decision? I, I think that would be a very prudent thing to do. I think there's a lot of decisions facing the library. Good idea. Uh, access in the pandemic is, is foremost in my mind. Good idea. Um, so, Mr. Curry, when are their terms already, are their terms expired? I mean, is, is this a timing issue at all? Um, Could we table it? Some... Some boards by code, um, the appointments are until uh, filled. I agree with Ms. Smith. She's made very good points. And um, we're talking about significant potential capital projects tied in with uh, the project you heard about. And we know that the library uh, received a significant uh, donation that they have to manage well. So I, I, I have to agree with Ms. Smith. I can withdraw my motion. Yeah, let's just find out about the timing. Maybe. Yeah. I'll withdraw my second. I'm, <laughs> as your representative on the body, I'm unaware of any critically time-sensitive uh, actions that must be made by the board. Yeah. <clears throat> I'd be fine tabling it. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and make a motion that we table this, um, and in tabling it that we, um, I, and I don't know how we do this uh, administratively if county staff or one of us should contact each of the applicants and ask that they um, attend virtually or in person our next regular meeting. Is that, I don't know if that's agreeable. If it is, maybe somebody could second. I would second, and I would just reiterate what I, what I prefaced my previous comments with which I think we're incredibly fortunate to have such a, a deep pool of talent to make these appointments from. Um, we just have a lot of things going on uh, with the library board, and I would like to know folks' positions on critical issues before we make the appointments. Yeah, great. If the board uh, in this setting could distill a set number of questions, I could forward those questions to the candidates um, so they could be prepared, uh, or you could just... Wait till they come. Well, I think for me, the guidelines would be what I've enumerated previously, which are um, uh, what's your position on um, making services available at the library uh, through the pandemic? Um, what other additional services do you envision we might be able to offer to support the community through the pandemic? And also, um, what would be your position on um, on uh, changes to the um, structure 
at this time or taking on additional capital improvements or new capital projects in regards to the library? I can tell you that the, the library board is actively working on uh, the preliminary select hiring the architectural firm for renovation slash expansion based on community input. And so the first step of the entire project would be to reach out into the community and the different stakeholders, including the Board of Supervisors, to determine what the community thinks is needed here for as far as library services, whether uh, books, community meeting space, computers, Wi-Fi, anything. And then uh, compile that information, work with an architect to then determine how, do, how would the library board deliver that uh, could they deliver that with the budget that they have right now, which is about $1.6 million? If not, how would they go about fundraising to, fund, to click the gap in funding? Uh, and, and then there's so many questions of how, when, where, all, all of that. Do it on the existing site, do it on a different site. There are just very, many, many variables at this point in time. I understand. I, I think we could... <clears throat> I wonder, um, Ms. Donahue, if we could, um, I think Ms. Smith's questions are excellent. I wonder if between now and, you know, a reasonable time in advance of the next meeting, maybe we could each come up with some additional questions and at least, if nothing else, have them ready so we could ask standardized questions when, when each of the applicants is here. Right. Well, and I think I want to make the intention clear. The intention of asking questions isn't to blindside or have right, a gotcha yeah. moment with the candidates. Yeah. It's just to get to know the candidates better totally and to agree. know what kind of, um, you know, uh, actions we can expect from them, from them, you know, in their participation on the board. Totally agree. So, um, and and they, you know, will probably learn some things about us in the process too. Bastani, maybe you could think about it and let us know how you want to organize it, and if we're going to like provide written questions to the applicants in advance, or if we just. Take, take a few minutes. I don't know how you want to proceed. I would think, Mr. Curry, if each individual sent you questions, um, could you just compile a list and then send it out to all of us for one final review? Uh, I can, but the, you wouldn't be able to make any decisions on that. What would be best is for the board to very clearly empower an individual or in, two individuals to take certain actions outside of the meeting. Um, if you each want to provide a question to me, I can compile those and pass them along, but I don't think it would be appropriate for me to send them back and then ask you to agree to that slated questions outside okay. of the meeting. I just don't want to have a lot of duplicated questions. Well, we can CC each other, but we just can't answer to each other. Okay. If I understand correctly. It just, it just invites the opportunity for a conversation if if those emails approach simultaneity of more than two members, it just and the perception is not great. Okay. But we could each individually submit. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that's probably our best route. We just each submit some each questions. Each submit some questions to Mr. Curry. Okay. Does the library have a meeting coming up or? Um, always. Hold on. The next meeting is. Never keep trying. You know, I'm not sure because of the holidays. It may not be till the, I think it's the 28th of January. Okay. All right. So if each board member will submit any questions they have for the applicants to Mr. Curry. Um, should probably try to get that done by the uh, week from today. That work. Sure. And so I believe on the floor is now a motion to table. I and, seconded that. And you seconded it. And I believe with that motion is to close discussion. Have members send me questions yep. and have me send those on to the candidates. Good. Okay. We don't need a vote on that. Yes. Do we, we do. All, all those in favor of sending the or tabling this and sending Mr. Curry the questions, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. Um, on to appointment, Rappahannock County Community Policy and Management Team. 
Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, we met, we discussed CPMT earlier in the meeting when the board appointed your representative. Uh, and uh, the Code of Virginia has a very specific slate of people who serve on CPMT, and that is the agency head of multiple um, uh, agencies that are involved in the child welfare or their designee. And so in this case, uh, the Juvenile Court Service Unit um, was Elaine Lassiter. She's left the position of the probation director. Uh, currently in that position is Ira Holland as an interim director, and they've request, uh, Mr. Holland has requested that we have a point, we appoint him to the CPMT, um, being the director and appoint himself. Um, you're aware as well that uh, Ms. Parker is uh, moving on to another locality, and uh, my conversation with her and the interim director, Kathy White, is that Kathy White uh, would be appropriate appointee for social services. Uh, beyond those organizations, there are uh, private provider representatives and a parent representative. Uh, Mr. Rayford uh, was the rep parent representative, and he's moved out of the area. Uh, and so we have received one application for a parent representative. This is typically a difficult position to fill, and so I'm grateful that we did find a candidate uh, for that slot. So if, if the board is uh, of a mind to do so, you could appoint this slate of three people, uh, or at least the two that represent the um, court services and uh, social services, and then he will be parent representative differently if that's how you choose to do it. Well, I'll make a motion. We go ahead and uh, appoint the slate that's presented. A second. This. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Uh, Mr. Curry, is, is, is Kathy White, is she resides in Rapid County? Uh, no. Sorry? Uh, not, that's not my okay. understanding. I'm confusing with somebody by that name who does. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay, we'll close discussion. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you. Appointment to the Agricultural and Forestal Districts. Yes, the Advisory Committee for the Agricultural and Forestal District uh, has one vacancy. Uh, that board needs to be filled with either landowners or landowners who are involved in uh, agricultural forestal production have, have to fill that category. You already have enough people to fill that category. Uh, so this person need only be a landowner but could also uh, have an agricultural and forestal production background. You do have one uh, applicant. Uh, which if board members remember, we had a vacancy on this for a very long time last time. Uh, so I'm very grateful that there is somebody willing to, to sit. It, it appears putting that raise in pay help find somebody. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably didn't it's have called arm twisting your neighbor. <laughs> Ms. Donna, if I may. Um, Absolutely. I, I, I recruited this candidate for this highly paid position. Um, this is Mr. Bruce Loth, and just by way of background, if you reviewed his application materials, he had an interest in a land survey business. He is a landowner, um, maybe 25 or 30 acres, old ski lodge area. He's extremely detail-oriented, um, works in, um, in software programming on the defense front, has GIS background, and uh, I can trust him wholeheartedly. And if, if you would allow me, I'll make a motion that we appoint him to the, to the committee. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second it. I will note that there is no term for these, and um, we'll keep you as long as you're willing. I'll make sure he never leaves. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other discussion? I'm just going to say uh, it appears both applying for a job like this and that he keeps horses, he may be of questionable <laughs> capacity. <laughs> uh, he's, he's pretty solid, and he has a high level security clerk, so. Any question about his mental capacity, I think, has been resolved through that process. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll close discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion carries. I'll be sure to stop at his house and congratulate him. 
All right. Um, well, you might be pushing it. <laughs> now we're going into old business developments regarding augmenting volunteer responders. What do we have? Paid ALO. Oh. Um, Ms. Smith, you might want to talk through what the Public Safety Committee did. I think you met. Uh, I, I, my preference, uh, Madam Chairman, would be for Mr. Curry to kick us off, and then I can report on the actions of the Public Safety Committee. Okay. Mr. Curry. Uh, well, I, I uh, prepared a rather lengthy um, history of this topic for the Public Safety Committee agenda, carried it forward over to this agenda item and added to the to the end of it uh, to incorporate the uh, recommendation from that committee. Um, I think it's um, pretty well known that uh, the association and the chiefs have indicated that they believe some form, of some form of assistance is needed to meet the um, requirements of our services agreement, and, uh, and they believe that paid EMS um, is the way to do that, and they recommend that be ALS 24-7. Uh, um, then later in the process, the uh, association, or the uh, chiefs and the executive committee of the association met in December to discuss the various methods through which paid EMS could be provided. The association, uh, the treasurer of the association previously prepared a number of uh, preliminary cost estimates and uh, put forward um, those to the executive committee and chiefs. And on the 13th, th both of those groups voted to recommend that an EMS chase buggy, not really find that term favorable, but uh, <laughs> be provided and how is it uh, company one washington volunteer fire and rescue um, my understanding just through um, orally is that washington volunteer fire and rescue will house a chase buggy at their facility um, but not provide a chase buggy and so the, um, the likelihood is that the local government would provide this chase buggy and the local government would provide the staff to staff the chase buggy, which would be some combination of full-time, part-time uh, ALS providers who would then be able to run calls um, whenever during the day and then either join up with an ambulance crew uh, to upgrade them to medic status at a scene and then uh, take that ambulance to the hospital or possibly at a scene may be able to determine that it's just an ambulance crew can take the patient to the hospital and then return back to uh, be ready for the next call. Uh, there was some debate uh, during those meetings about the best way to do this, but at the end of the day, there were votes taken and a uh, recommendation uh, to the Public Safety Committee that this chase buggy be pursued. The Public Safety Committee uh, met on December 28th, and after discussing the recommendation from the association, voted to recommend to, to you uh, to, that uh, you should pursue the recommendation of the association. I made it pretty clear at that meeting that there's a lot of work left to do. Uh, the agreement discusses scheduling and process and that that scheduling and process is supposed to be handled jointly by the Public Safety Committee and the association. Uh, but perhaps the most important part of all that is direction. And uh, before we can really dig into the scheduling and process of implementing pay DMS, it would be, how are we going to do that? Uh, I also made it known that I'm a little leery of the idea of a chase buggy for a few different reasons. It's a very big deal. It's been done well in other communities, uh, but there are, there are pros and cons. Uh, those have been vetted by the bodies that, that uh, considered this before now, and the recommendation has come through to you uh, to move forward in that, that manner. And uh, Mr. Williams is here. He was at that meeting, um, so he may be able to help add something I may have missed. Uh, Ms. Smith was at the meeting, and uh, Mr. Frazier was at the, plan the Public Safety Committee meeting, and um, I believe you were at the association. association meeting. So amongst all of us, there are plenty of people that were here. Were there. And Mr. Williams, if I understand correctly, you now chair the association, or you're the lead president? president. I guess is we may have some questions for you. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Madam Chairman, if I just may, uh, I did want to uh, echo what Mr. Curry said about the Public Safety Committee meeting and our approach to this topic. Um, we were narrow in our discussion of this topic because we thought that was appropriate, or I thought that was appropriate. Mr. Fraser, if you, if you have anything to add, please do. But basically, our scope uh, on the Public Safety Committee is that we, uh, we are only involved in this from a public safety point of view which is does it uh, meet the requirements of the fire services agreement and does it help the companies to um, continue to meet the um, parameters of the fire services agreement. And the discussion at the uh, public safety committee meeting was, was largely that it did and it seemed a, a logical way forward uh, based on um, the recommendation from the association which um, is specifically I think designed to keep volunteers engaged. Um, and so uh, if that is the best way we can support our volunteers, I think that is the best way forward. Um, but we did have a, we had a narrow approach. We didn't discuss all six options. We just vetted the one option which had been referred to us, which we thought was appropriate. Um, I think it's, we all were also very clear at the Public Safety Committee that whatever um, is additionally asked of us to uh, look into the personnel, staffing, hours, any kinds of logistics that the county may be concerned about as to how to pursue this solution from a public safety point of view, um, we would certainly be very willing and would undertake that as soon as possible. I was very glad that the Public Safety Committee could put together a meeting uh, with the decision coming from the Association on the 13th or the recommendation coming from the Association on the 13th. Um, it can be a very challenging time to put together a meeting and we were able to put together a meeting um, to get this to the board today. We met on the 28th, immediately after Christmas, to get this done for everyone today. So I just wanted to thank the members of the Public Safety Committee, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have, or if Mr. Fraser has anything additional to say. No, I think, uh, Ms. Smith, you summed it up um, perfectly. But uh, I think that... Uh, I have to echo Mr. Curry's uh, concerns that uh, we have to put this in place because this is what's been recommended and this is probably the least uh, costly measure that we can take immediately, but I think we're going to have to stay on top of it. Ms. Ms. Donahue, if I may, yes. um, I just wanted to ask uh, Mr. Williams a question and if it would be okay, I'd like Mr. Glenny to um, reiterate his earlier comments in this context. So that, so that I can connect them to this discussion. Um, Mr. Williams, I attended, I attended a, a chief's meeting that you, you attended, and my recollection was that you, um, and tell me if I'm mischaracterizing your comments, but my recollection of your comments at that time was we have to do something, and it should be a small step forward. And if that's the correct characterization of what you said, does this fit the bill? Yeah. Basically, um, uh, what we have discussed and I've said over time is the time's coming where the volunteers need some help. Um, we're trying to find something that will help maintain the volunteers um, and maybe help build the volunteers. Mm -hmm. If they know that, hey, if I go down to the station, we're, we're going to get out on the call because I'll, we'll have this person helping us. Um, but that's what we're looking at there. And one of the biggest things we looked at also is how, how do we go into this to where we don't have a big shock to the taxpayers. Right. Um, and that would, I mean, a big shock would be putting people at different stations yeah. and all of that. Um, we, we, we can make this work. How long we can make it work, that, that, that's the magic question, is how long could it work. Um, uh, we're hoping it'll work for, for a long time yeah. with the volunteers. Basically, as Mr. Curry stated, this person would be there, and if the EMS call comes out, they'll respond out to assist that company to get their ambulance out. Um, if that company gets out and this person does not need it, that person can come on back and that volunteer department can handle with their volunteers, still keeping the volunteers involved. If not, they'll get on with them and um, help transport and treat the patient and everything. How many individuals will need to be recruited to provide the, the contemplated coverage? I mean, how many, how many individuals will have to be in the pool of uh, roughly, advanced life support providers? Roughly, I think what we came up with maybe six to eight, but it also depends whether they're part-time or full-time. 
Um, and that's not a decision um, I feel the association or the chiefs should make. That, that's y'all's decision, right. whether we're going to be told you're going to get full-time people or fund them for part-time. Uh, if we do part-time, there's going to have to be a bigger pool um, of people to pull from because they're going to be working other jobs. If you have full-time, you're going to have certain dedicated people to work the schedule. So. Is it your expectation that the market is such that we won't have difficulty recruiting for that many positions, whether full or part-time? Uh, well, one good thing is if we done a mix of part-time and full-time, we could get we could also do something that Mr. Fraser has always talked about um, when I was part of the county, is the grant process. Mm -hmm. Fauquier County and other counties around us, as they've done part-time, some part-time people, they've used those when it comes time for the grant process to say, hey, we like to make these full-time. And then they were able to get grants to where it allowed you to build your budget as far as first year was 100%, then it breaks it down to within three to four years, the county picks up the okay. whole thing. That's one plus with some volunteers. Um, but one, I mean, with part time. But one thing I can say if you have all part time, like I say, they're working other jobs. I'm myself right now, know the COVID restrictions for volunteering and everything. You could have part time people that could get on that. Um, with, as long as COVID goes on, you could have some that, um, that, that where we get a, we get lucky and we have a pool door, we yeah. don't have to worry about that. Um, but we, we don't know that. But if you went full time, if you had six, six, six to eight full time people, then they would be dedicated to your county. But what's it going to cost us is the question. And then um, <clears throat> it sounds like we're going to try this to see if it will work. Could you identify off the top of your head performance measures that we would have to apply to evaluate with objectivity whether or not it's working? I mean, what what types of what types of ways should we use to measure success and whether this is right. actually uh, just just off the top of my head, but not. And I'd want to meet with the executive committee of the association and the chiefs and all to come up with those performance measures. But just and the department presidents and everything. But just to, some things we can look at as far as if that chase buggy goes out, how long are they on the scene waiting for another ambulance to get there? It are the first dudes getting their ambulance out to assist this person in the chase buggy. Are we still having to wait an extended period of time for an ambulance to come from across the county somewhere to meet this person? Those could be some performance measures we could do. And I also can tell you the fire service agreement has one performance measure in there we need to tighten down on that we could use, and that's the uh, percentage of your calls and things like that that you respond to. Those are a couple of things we could put in place okay. um, to, to help measure this. How often is that person happen to be used versus how often are our volunteers kicking in to, to help with it as well? Um, and we, we could put several different things in play, but without talking to the executive committee and the chiefs or whatever, I really don't want to go down too far saying this is what we would do right. and, and all that. So. Thanks a lot. Uh, but there is, we, we can put performance measures in to, to know exactly, is it working, is it not working, and all. But I want to stress, especially for the citizens, that we looked at this as we're, we're trying to be good stewards of the money yep. and everything, and, and take care of public safety in the county. And by doing that, uh, like what I've always been told, this is a baby step. Hopefully it'll work for a couple years like it did in the other counties. We may put it into play and come back and say, hey, <laughs> It's working for a little bit, but we got to do something additional. I hope not. I hope it helps, and I hope it really helps with our volunteers and everything. But this is what's good. What we think right now is the best to help maintain our volunteers where they're still running and they still have a part part in it. Because I have seen systems where they've been um, have paid come into the county, and um, the paid versus volunteers working together with a big force sometimes has hurt the volunteers more. Yeah. And that's what we don't want to do here. So. Well, thank you. Your so. previous comments and your comments today are very thoughtful and okay. much appreciated. Thank you. Um, Ms. Donahue, would it be okay if we heard from Mr. Glennie as a member of the Fire Lobby Board? Um, I, I don't know if we want to let the board finish with Mr. Williams first and then have Mr. Glennie oh, okay. come up, which do you right. think is better? Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, that's good. Anybody else on the board? I've got a couple of questions. But I did think of one follow-up point to make. It's more of a comment than a question, um, and uh, I hadn't occurred to me what I made in my previous remarks, but one thing that did come up at the Public Safety Committee is going to be the um, 
the importance of keeping dispatch in on this mm -hmm. to make it a, a successful solution. Yes, I, and, I, and to get then to maximize our investment in terms of the return we're getting uh, with the response, and and the, and applying that also to the Chester Gap solution as well. I, I can tell you, standing here now as president of the association, the chiefs will be meeting. They will be meeting more more regular um, to look in at, at our dispatch policies we have currently, and we will be looking at. What do we need to put in play to better serve the citizens as far as even though a certain companies do, do we put another company automatically on with them and things like that? That will be one of the assignments coming the first of the year for the chiefs to Great. sit down and review. But that and that, that is something that will have to be tied in with this as well as far as um, um, we, we've been looking at different policies um, one, that when we met at company two um, back in, the, in 2020, end of the year, uh, we talked about some different policies there to implement to know getting a quicker staff unit on the on the road and everything so we will um, they will have that assignment to work on and then I know there have been discussion I don't remember if there had ever been a resolution but there is a, a way to pull metrics from our dispatch system that was going to be an add-on Gary and there was some question about whether that would work for us or not uh. I'll just I'll say it's yet to be determined. It's it's very difficult to yeah. pull data with the metrics that we want yeah. out of any system, let alone this system. I, I can say we're still at the old school where we'd have to sit down, go through the book, flip the pages, and see who got out and, and all that. Um, hopefully, within the co next coming months, the sheriff and I will be sitting down to see what we could do and um, how we can do it. But one thing you need to remember is when you start collecting that data, it takes a whole year's worth of that data to be collected for you to start getting anything from it. So, um, I, I know that the volunteers do so much already. I'm, I'm reluctant to ask you to sit down and crunch numbers in addition to everything else that you do. Yeah. We usually so do if it's something a, um, we can do. That's that's the great. response study. They usually do that. And um, when I was working for the county, I felt sorry for the, the committee that had done that because they went through every sheet looking at the call, what departments were dispatched, how long that took them to get out, what units did get out, and everything. And um, we're beyond those times, but it'll take us a year to, to get there, to get the numbers in place. Um, Thank you. Uh, I'll just, I'll add uh, to the conversation that um, with Kevin standing before us in his position, um, obviously he's not in his former position, and you all know that we're in the recruiting process uh, that um, application period closes here pretty soon and we'll be now with this in our sites we have a little more focus and direction on who may best what traits may best help yeah. us navigate the process and so that will work through the application the uh, interview process uh, in our process to um, hopefully narrow down the, the many applications that we received into a pool that makes sense it's my intention to bring the association in on that, the sheriff in on that, uh, one or two board members in on that in a committee forum to interview our selected candidate. <coughs> Hopefully find somebody that can help uh, this and assist uh, the association with some of these conversations relative to dispatch and how to do some of those in our data. And recall, this will be a full-time employee now, whereas Kevin never had that luxury, so to say. <laughs> Uh, having full-time employment elsewhere and employment here. Yeah, and the only thing I want to say is the, the person that uh, Mr. Curry ultimately hires for the position it is going to be an ultimate key player with work when we move forward and how they can be used and everything. And uh, I would highly suggest if you're not used to the model or you haven't seen the model, um, I'd be glad to get um, um, talk with Mr. his name is Mr. Litke, Brian Litke, um, he's the director of fire and rescue in Clark County mm -hmm. and what they're doing up there and the many conversations I've had with him as far as certain things that they've done there. Um, I'm not saying that's what we want to do, but there's a lot of aspects there and their model that would, we should look here at in the county that could help us in the long run. Could we, so, um, could we go up there and meet with him? Mm -hmm. we, we actually, when the, um, committee, um, that went around to put together the, um, uh, recommendations um, we spoke with them then as far as what they do okay. so, and, and they've done the same thing they've done a, a chase vehicle for a long time they hired some part-time they hired some full-time okay. and now they're taking opportunity of the grants out there like mr. Fraser always talked about to build their full-time force okay. um, but again our biggest thing here is 
how to move forward to be good stewards of taxpayers' money and help save our volunteers. Right Mr. Now. Frazier, is the, is the concept that you have part-time as a catalyst for attracting grant money? You have to have something. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I just know that they, they exist, and I know that uh, Albemarle is the last county that I'm aware of to use it, but, I mean, there's 95 counties, so I don't have any idea right. how to date my... I guess I'm just wondering about the concept of having starting with part time and that. Well, they, but they have. Well, if, if I could interrupt just for a second, yeah. because that's the way my mind works. Uh, the one particular grant that 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 uh, that uh, Mr. Williams mentioned, that one safe, they're all safer grants, I believe. They they come under that heading of safer grants. But you have the one where once you have a, I guess, a plan of of of, of, of forward motion uh, to work on. And let's say you need $3 million to finance it, you, you would get X number of dollars, which would be your 100% and in the next year, 75, 50, right. and 25. But they also have other grants. I know they have uh, grants for volunteer retention and recruitment. So they probably have something in the middle there. Well, I, I just don't know. I haven't spent a lot of time recently on it, but there's, you know, there's deadlines for these things, as, as there are with all grants. Well, I just want to understand that having a part-time component yes. puts us in a position to I, I don't Especially know. Especially for, I'm talking more to the safer grant that Mr. Frazier mentioned because okay. I know Falkir's used it, Warren County's used okay. it, Culpeper's looked at it, um, Madison is looking at it um, from some of their standpoints. Um, so we'll have a full-time person to look into yes. this sort of opportunity. That, that would be, I'm sure, a great help because... Because the safer grant is a big, is where you can get a lot of money from uh, for it, but you got to have certain things in place already to get it. We never had part-time people. Okay. We, we would have to go for it from nothing to full-time. When you're showing trying to fill part-time positions, it's, it's a little bit more. Uh, that's how Falker County's built their pool up with the people they have. So. Okay. Mr. Pierce? Uh, Kevin, they, uh, with your experience, uh, if we got a full-time uh, EMS coordinator or whatever it's gonna, the title's going to be. Uh, emergency services. Emergency services. Uh, Three hats. Individual, uh, if, if how would it work if we made him basically a czar where he had where the there was a chain of command and uh, what whatever he told the individual chiefs you know was had to go I mean would that work if he had that kind of authority to kind of rein in the uh, compliance of well we want to we want to maintain our volunteers so right, if you put right. somebody in there that is going to come and tell your chiefs that right this is what you're going to do and everything we're kind of getting away from that gotcha now what you could put in place um, and Mr. Curry, he, he's seen this model before, is where this person is a true liaison. He, he's our person that the association works with. The, right. When the chiefs meet, the chiefs are meeting with this person. Right. If he knows something has to be done, he, he's pushing the chiefs to get it done. Right. Um, and then he's, he's a liaison between all that coming back to the board or Mr. Right. Curry and everything. Yeah. But um, <laughs> we're not at that point where we want someone to come in and be. Because we're dealing with personalities, yeah. 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 I got it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, we got seven different departments, and each department has so many members, so you can see the different personalities we have. So it's a it's a juggle. Yeah. Appreciate it, Mr. Williams. With the chase buggy concept, I know I have heard that we have at least one ambulance in the county that's not being used. Mm -hmm. Is there any value of just fitting it out yeah. as an ALS ambulance and Good. making that the chase buggy? We would have to work with the office AMS on that because you're getting some strict regulations right. and everything by responding a unit out with one person on it. That's why you, it's probably better to respond someone out in a chase vehicle to meet an uh, already staffed unit. Um, well, I shouldn't say staff, but meet a unit to where they get on, they make that crew and everything. Um, I'd have to look, we'd have to sit down and look at the regulations and everything. Um, I'm not a big player of saying, hey, here you go, you respond to this. Yeah, they'd have more tools in their um, toolbox and everything, but um, you get out there if that one person where they pull up and you're waiting 10 or 15 minutes for the other people to show up and, yeah. and everything with an ambulance. Um, what could happen is uh, the paid chase vehicle gets to the scene. We look for an ambulance over and over again. We can't find one. A driver could take the ambulance to the scene, meet the medic, and then leave the chase vehicle at the scene. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and there's other avenues once we know which way we can go and start planning more. Um, Washington has also agreed that if they have crews, have a crew at their station, a driver, and this person gets toned out to go, that we'll talk more about policies and procedures as far as do they jump on their unit and go out. So 
um, this person is responding with the unit, they get out there and that department has their ambulance on the scene, they get off and go with them. Um, there's, there's a lot of policies and procedures to go with it. And once we know which way we're going and how we want to go, then we can sit down and start looking at the best ways. So, um. yeah, logistically, that's the, the part that I'm really interested in. It sounds great. And I love that the volunteers are still very involved. Um, but I want to make sure that dispatch and uh, you all have what you need to be successful and then not headbutting with the, right. the paid people I, versus the volunteer. Right. I, I think um, one thing about the dispatch, because I know we talk about that quite a bit, um, it just needs to be, we just need to have the communications there with the sheriff to talk more about this is what we need. And um, when I say communications, we need to be putting something on the table to her saying, this is what we we need you to implement right. or whatever. Um, and there's a lot of things we can do to make to make it better. So hopefully this year we'll, we'll make some big strides. So. Very glad you're staying involved. So. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. Thanks thank a lot. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Great answers. Is there any other questions for me? I have a son I got to pick up from. Go pick him up. JV <laughs> practice. Yeah, get, like get out of here. Put on your red light. That, just hey, my wife is <laughs> rolling my phone up. That's not good. <laughs> public safety. Don't leave him out there. It's yeah. public safety for me if I don't get him. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Go thank you. Go yeah. Thank you. Care, thank you. Yeah. Still want Mr. Yeah, Glennie. if if I could. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Glennie, I don't know what your conversation was. Sorry to put you on the spot. Yeah. You're pretty comfortable with the microphone. I got a little bit of experience. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, first, I want to say I agree with everything Mr. Williams said. Okay. And I am incredibly <laughs> <laughs> and I am incredibly happy that he is now the president of the association. That's a big deal. All right. And to answer a couple other points where I can provide some information, the issue on the data is or or the why it takes so much time is they have to integrate what the county dispatch has versus the records that are in the individual companies. And there is software that can help with that, and it's relatively cheap, and that should be authorized relatively quick and get on with it to, so you're not spending a whole bunch of volunteer labor doing it by hand. All right, uh, and I think you're headed in that direction, but they all, the paid staff should be county employees managed by the emergency services coordinator is my own stupid opinion. Sorry, now what was your question? No, I just wanted, I just wanted to, for you to reiterate your earlier remarks, just about your concerns about fire and rescue and where we're headed generally. Um, my con my concern is is not that that individual companies don't need BLS paid staff or will not need them okay. soon. All right, such as Chester Gap. The issue is how is it paid for? Okay, and and. I'm concerned that if we start doing it for one, it sets a precedent because I have a feeling there's two or three others that are going to be right behind. And when that happens, you could be hiring a lot of people that are sitting there doing nothing. All right. So to disincentivize that, you know, and the idea is to do this specialized tax district. So in the case of Chester Gap, Roughly, I think it's about $200 per household they would have to pay to, to support that, all right? And I mean, to me, as, as a Amosville resident, the chances of that BLS responder showing up in Amosville is pretty small. Okay. And I understand that it's a community need, but community-wise, we're already paying all the operational cost. So it's, it's how you do the cost share, and I just don't think we should be incentivizing every company doing it because I, I, I feel it's coming, all right? Because there's other companies that have already talked about doing the same thing. And okay, I got you. That's, that's the problem. Uh, if I all right? could, uh, it's not that I disagree that Chester Gap needs, you know, a BLS provider because they're down to one or whatever. Right. And the other thing that, that I like about the Chase buggy vehicle, because you see it in other companies such as Amosville, that when you have a professional ALS person, that will inspire more volunteers to move up through the system. I think it will slow down the need for BLS in the other companies or, or delay it, so to speak. We'll get, we may get more volunteers. Interesting. That's, it's, a, it's a who knows. And uh, last point on the emergency service coordinator. 
that is the person I think that should be managing it. And I disagree that they should be in charge of any type of control. Leave that with the chiefs. Otherwise, you're going to step on some big toes and it's going to get real ugly. Because that, that's where all the other counties have failed, is when they brought in the fire chief and had that person be the central control. Excellent. Is that you. all you needed? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Did you have but no, I, I was going to say that uh, it's a different different service, uh, but uh, it's, it's similar to the Water and Sewer Authority. Right now it furnishes sewer uh, yeah. for Sperryville, but Amosville is not particularly paying for that. Neither is uh, people in Scrabble or Chester Gap. Okay. All right, if we could, I think everybody's done on this. We can move into... Madam Chairman, I, I don't mean to disagree, but I think that we all agree about the approach, but I, I want to know what the next actions are. From staff, I mean, what do we need to move this forward? Well, I think a critical point is if the Board of Supervisors believes you have enough information uh, to... Um, determine that this method, recommended method, is um, meets your expectations and you believe that it will provide the um, services that our citizens need, I think you could, could make that statement. As I noted earlier, there's a lot of work left to do, and so I, I would think that if you believe it's the right method, then there's a task for me as staff and my hopefully very soon to be filled um, or services coordinator to start developing the process and schedule together with the association so it can be presented to the Public Safety Committee uh, through one or more options. And then those are going to be very heavily interwoven to the budget, which now is right on the doorstep. So, uh, but if, if the board has the information to believe that this is the method, it would be very helpful for me for that to be made clear right now. I mean, I feel like I, I should, should carry this ball forward uh, from the Public Safety Committee that, that we do need to act on these recommendations and to entrust staff and ask them to act uh, as quickly as possible um, to uh, take action on these recommendations, um, knowing that we are in a sensitive time where we are bringing on new staff and they will be integral to the process. Um, I still think we, we need to stress the importance of getting this in motion um, as soon as possible. I, I mean, this all started with a conversation with the chiefs. I don't mean to put you on the spot, Gary, but I think you were on vacation, so it's a time marker for me. In September, yeah. right? In September, the chiefs told us that they needed this, that they needed help. And, you know, now here we are in January. Well, and going so, back before that, you had the association sending the letter in the February, board, including correct. the budget. Yeah. About part-time. So, you know, this has, been, this has been languishing. I think it's got good momentum now with this meeting from the association and the public safety committee. And I think we need to just keep the focus and emphasis on this. Um, you know, we are, we are, you know, thank God, very fortunate to live in Rappahannock County and to sort of seem to be having a, a moderate time with COVID. Um, but it, it is, our volunteers are very vulnerable and I have, I have concerns that we, we need to keep this moving forward. And that might be a very sort of vague motion, but um, until we have staff on board to, um, to get more traction, that, that may be the, just that we need. We need to keep the emphasis on implementing this approach. And so what I heard is you want staff to develop the process and schedule with the association. That is correct. That's until, my motion. Until we have a clear logistic, I need a flow chart on how this is going to work before I'm going to be able to jump and say, yes, this is great. Flow chart on how the model works? Yep. Between the volunteer and the paid and dispatch, I mean, they've all got to be. Well, the, the dispatch is, is dispatching from manual agreed to by the association. So you know, that's the simplest part of all this. <laughs> It'll have to be edited, though. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But, uh, that, that's easy. Yep. Um, the, and I'm sure the sheriff will carry out what is agreed to by the association and, and dispatch lungs is functionally capable, and I have no reason to believe it wouldn't be. Um, my biggest concern is that we will have county employees and volunteer members, and there will be some confusion. Well, you know, do I have to listen to you? Do you listen to me? Uh, that's my concern. So that's the process uh, that needs to be worked out very carefully. 
and it needs to be done in a way that everybody understands it's collaborative. And we need to hire part-time or full-time providers for the county who recognize the model that we have and fit with that model. Um, because we'll, we can't you know, bring in people who don't recognize the value of the volunteer system. So, Ms. Smith, are you saying we just need to give staff the tentative go-ahead to put more of the logistics together and, and work with the association and the chiefs? I hate to ask this question, but could you repeat the motion, Gary? <laughs> <laughs> I believe the motion is to for the board to identify that to agree with the recommendation of the association and the public safety committee that the chase vehicle is the appropriate first step for us in the community for EMS and that staff now needs to work with the association to develop, and these are words in the agreement, the process and the schedule to implement it. And the expense. I assume we need to well, that, that is always at your, uh, you will be making those decisions as we go through the budget. Budget, yep. uh, But yeah, of course. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I will, I'll gladly second it. I appreciate everyone who's contributed to this. Ms. Donahue, Ms. Smith, Mr. Frazier, Mr. Williams, Mr. Glennie have all done a lot of work on this, so thank you. <coughs> we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. If we can get through fire levy guidelines update. This is something that um, Mr. Komar did last year. He presented, I think he sent a letter, an email with the attached documents and mm -hmm. the changes. Um, the fire levy board went through it very carefully. And I think the changes, Mr. Curry, correct me if I'm wrong, are in italics. No, uh, the changes are not identified in any special font. And the documents that are attached, the attached documents are the new final version. Okay, all right. Um, the only change that I think. Oh, there may be some in italics, pardon me. Yeah, it looked but that's like just when emphasis. I looked at it. But, um, the only change that I think is uh, something that we definitely have to have a conversation about is the capital expense was. Um, set at $7,500 for I don't know how many years, uh, but the uh, Fire Levy Board discussed this and with the increase in expense of just about everything in our lives these days, um, felt that we should uh, bump that up to $10,000, which would be the cap between an operational expense and a capital expense for the stations when they submit their um, invoices for audit. The big picture, you budget annually for the fire companies based on their operational expenses, and you don't want that operational expense to be influenced by one-time purchases of capital items, you know, fluctuating up and down, up and down. The capital has been understood to be the responsibility of the companies through their fundraising or EMS cost recovery or any other method of funding that they have. That operational expense, which should be a more, more routine burn, is what the board has agreed to cover. And so in this case, if there are one-time purchases with a long life of $10,000 or more, those are capital. That's not something that is expected to happen every year, and, and they should. those are the responsibility of the company. We are tentatively scheduled to meet uh, February 9th I chose that date because we have to give the chiefs time uh, to review all of the submissions um, and then they forward those on to the fire levy board for our uh, audit. All of these changes would be for January 1 forward for that next half a year. Um, and the idea is that all the companies will use the same format, same rules, everybody knows exactly um, what they need to do in order to clearly show their operational expenses to the county so that the county can budget in the next year uh, enough to uh, carry those companies. While we're there, would this be the proper time to uh, discuss uh, when a company makes a, uh, a new purchase? And it's one thing to cycle an ambulance out and cycle a new one in, and it's an ongoing operation, but the 
the purchase of a large piece of equipment that they didn't have previously, the county has no little or no involvement in the in the uh, process. But then it shows up on operational expenses a year later. So I just wonder at what point in time do we ever address that? Point. I mean, actually, I, I do completely agree with you, hoping that the new uh, full-time position working with the association and the chiefs uh, will look at that scenario because we have one in my mind with Tanker 4 and the need for the radio expense. Exactly. Um, we don't have anything in place that I'm aware of um, that says if you buy a vehicle, you're responsible for everything else because we do... Um, maintenance and everything is covered by the fire levy board, but I do believe at some point all of the companies need to work with hopefully this full-time position and look at the county as a whole and say what kind of equipment do we need or we have everything we need, don't anybody buy anything um, because we get into the scenario where we've got I think a $10,000 bill um, and I don't think you want to have that just an open, right. it can happen anytime. Yeah. Now, as far as the, we'll get to the radios in a minute, but as far as they go, the company could technically buy it. It's, op, you know, would be deemed an operational expense under the old rules, new rules. Yeah. Um, but I don't want them to buy it uh, because all the other radios are county assets covered by the county warranty and, yeah. and yeah. maintenance. And so I want us to own those radios. Same difference. Um, anyway, but uh, they could just through operational expense buy radios. I don't know if that answered your question, but I hope it's well, something that I, I we just think into. I just thought I'd throw that out there because uh, it's not just I'm not trying to pick on Flint Hill for for you know buying a new piece of equipment that we really had no involvement in, but we saw where Castleton and Chester Gap did the same thing with those uh, army vehicles they call Serve, and uh, we had to outfit them with some equipment probably, but I know that we started paying operational expense on them, and so that would be something that would be in. Included in the Fire and Rescue Services Agreement, it is not now, and there's broad discretion given to the companies to deliver the services they think are necessary in the ways that they think are necessary. And uh, the more the board, uh, what I've said at past Fire Levy Board meetings, the more the board is expected and the citizens are expected to pay for these things, the more the companies should should um, understand that the board is going to want to be involved in those decisions. Exactly. And so, and that is part of the reason why the companies have basically said, we don't need you involved in capital payment right now uh, because we won't make those decisions ourselves. But you, you do say there is a follow on tail of that operational expense. Uh, all of it is much more affordable than a 100% paid fire and rescue operation. Debbie, uh, your colleague from the Federal Lobby Board. Yes, Mr. A little clarification though, fire the service agreement does require the strategic plan, which didn't just do personnel, it also does capital expenditures, all right? And if you know that, what it said was the capital expenditures over the apparatus is fine, all right? But then we bought a tanker anyway. So that's the mechanism that you have into it, is to see what's coming. You don't have direct control over that. Right. And there is something in the guidance that if they buy used equipment, you don't pay for operational costs or repairs for the first of the year. <coughs> right. So they don't buy a junk I think all my guess is all of that will be reviewed by the new hire and hopefully we can all work together on that. It's a delicate balance balance of keeping the independent companies fiercely independent, independent and and uh, action-oriented and bringing in county government control and so there's it's a delicate balance but it's difficult for them to be fiercely independent when the taxpayers foot in the bill so like I say there's got to be some give and take absolutely any other uh, discussion on the fire levy uh, guidance update guidelines update do you need any action from us on this this evening yes yeah, so the the um, the agreement, the services agreement, basically states that the the rules on how the companies uh, submit their data for the budget 
in paragraph 42, um, are based on the process developed by the Fire Levy Board and approved by the Board of Supervisors. And so the Fire Levy Board has put forward this process through identified in these three documents and is asking the Board to approve them. There really aren't very many major changes. Yes. No. The Fire Levy Board is a pretty tight ship. And, and they, I think Mr. Glennie has probably a 20-page spreadsheet that shows all the purchases over time, and it's very, very detailed. Um, they, everybody on the board takes the audit very seriously. Um, and all that we basically did was do some tweaking to, instead of you have to get three um, uh, bids, you can actually... Um, it's recommended from the fire levy board that you get those bids because we recommend that to everyone, but we can't make an independent nonprofit do the bids. And as you said, it's the only substantive change is that capital everything else. And the yep. Fire levy boards. Yep. Well, and I, I think it was last up, it was last increased three years ago from five thousand to seventy-five. Well, and I think I was at this meeting in Castleton, and I seem to recall the recommendation was unanimous. Correct. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I would I would make a motion that we adopt the changes presented in the agenda this evening. Thank you. Do I have a second? I'll second. Any discuss any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Uh, and then number two, Mr. Curry recommended change to Board of Supervisors meeting agenda policy. Uh, yeah, this is a change that I uh, suggested to the board uh, past weeks that it appeared to be appropriate based on uh, the length of some of the discussions that have happened at the beginning of your meetings. Presentations right now are uh, set to happen following um, a consent agenda and public comment. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it might make more sense to have presentations just after the school report. And if you have um, uh, people from industry or uh, groups that are coming to make those presentations, they can get them done and get out of here before you dig into the meat of your agenda. Uh, just a recommendation, and uh, if this is something that the board would like to do, uh, you could identify that through a vote and your policy will be changed. Madam um, Chairman, my, um, my only c concern reviewing this uh, recommendation is that uh, in regards to tonight's agenda, this would not have worked because we had to adopt the, the res we had to vote as part of the consent agenda for the presentations that were then presented later in the agenda. So I'm not sure how we could yes. do presentations after the school board and then adopt what we've just presented right. so, so certain types of presentations I, I don't know if there'd be a way to split that into uh, presentations as in presentations that don't require action versus um, information recognitions or something like that that we would then put in after the um, the consent agenda which we could, could certainly split off we, presentations like today um, recognizing people for their service could we just could we just as a matter of business not include such uh, resolution adoption as part of the consent agenda and just have that as a preceding item or I notice on the uh, on the uh, title block it says rules committee so you think maybe we could just uh, send it to the rules committee to work out some of those wrinkles yeah, that would be a fine idea bring it back next month with the wrinkles removed yeah yes, you could please. just have those presentations at the night uh, yeah. presentation section rather than the day you, you adopt it in, in your old business, new business, or consent agenda during the day, and then you hand it to a person at night, then you wouldn't have to do the, we have to recess and sign this document uh, process. But also, you're talking about president, like Mr. Ockery waited for a couple of hours before he gave yep. his little presentation, and that was unnecessary. Wait. And then, I mean, remember that somebody had something, some kind of presentation when we had the uh, Second Amendment sanctuary, and that person sat through nighttime is, hours and hours. Yeah, nighttime is different, and I didn't make a change yeah. there because the advertised right. time of public hearings right. is seven o'clock. Yeah, yeah. You could decide to have the advertised time of public hearings at seven thirty, and then have a few matters on the agenda beforehand, and then when the hour came yeah. to seven thirty, you would switch over and handle your public hearings. A lot of boards do it that way. Um, 
It does sound so. like it would make sense for the rules committee to take a look at all of that. And come That's back. A good idea. Yeah. Yeah, those all good comments. Yes. Anything else on that? Okay. Um, preliminary budget discussion. I was asked by a uh, board member uh, to have this on the agenda. The schedule that I prepared for you included uh, an item that this would be an appropriate to time to provide preliminary input uh, to me. Um, for example, if uh, uh, the board wanted to uh, me to structure a budget around a uh, 10 cent real estate tax rate uh, reduction, I would need to really start figuring out how to do that. And I say those numbers because I find it very unlikely that you would do that. Um, but uh, thank but you for welcome. making it a reduction. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, are there certain things that you want me to start from a very base level incorporating into the budget? I would only say that in the context of our chase buggy discussion, just making sure that <clears throat> whatever I believe you had, you had some money set aside for that or, or some form of paid EMS in the last budget cycle. So just making sure that that's fine tuned and thought through is kind of an obvious point for me. Of course. Yes. And then we're waiting on, um, I think we're still waiting on the follow up report from, I get all these names confused, is it Wiley Wilson? Wiley Wilson, we have a scope and fee document that is available for review by the building committee uh, uh, based on the last meeting, uh, the, joint, the joint meeting we had and when Mr. Vaughn was here. Right. Uh, that is ready for review. Okay. Um, Baker Tilly is the HR group that did the classification and compensation study. And then also, uh, while I'm talking, there was a lot of discussion uh, among board members about health insurance last right. year. about. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, what, um, which of the different, uh, I don't know what the right word is, uh, policy uh, offerings should be provided to staff, uh, paid entirely by the county, partially by the county, which should yep. be our basis, should we align with the schools, should we align with our communities, should we just keep doing what we're doing, should we change the method through which we, switch, we share the cost. Uh, so that may be something the board wants to dig into. And I know there was a thought that that could happen over the summer, but I, I believe uh, yeah. the pandemic. Well, those are, way that. those are three big, big items. Um, the second, just to follow up on the Wiley Wilson point, I think it's whatever the term of art is, envelope preservation protection. I mean, what are we going to do to make sure these buildings are as protected as they can be? And depending on the timeline, I'm guessing it, should be contemplated money should be set aside for that sort of initial step purpose in this upcoming fiscal year budget yeah i don't want to get too far into budgeting but those sort of things are uh one-time use of funds okay. those are easy to budget for any time of the year okay um it's the recurring need of funds with, that are really critical for okay. you to really dig into and, and that's not to say we don't want to look at the capital budget at the same time, particularly if there is a debt service component that will yeah. be a recurring cost. Um, but you have budget right now in the capital budget, yeah. uh, frozen, to tackle some building issues. Okay. Uh, we just need to decide when to unfreeze and which projects should we tackle. I mean, constituents say, what are your big ticket items? Okay, I mean, just to put, whittle it down to that, and immediately I say, pay DMS, buildings. So. <laughs> At a high level, that's what I care about as we start this budget discussion. I had a concern, and I'm not sure how this will time out, but um, I know that we've uh, we're, we've uh, approved the appraisals uh, of the county property. The that yeah, the estimates, uh, which I would I oh. would think the way that that kind of feeds into the tax process. Is that that would then influence the amount of the tax bills eventually, and how does Not that align? Not necessarily. If okay. if the assessed value increases more than enough to increase the tax revenue, then you have to advertise an equalized tax rate uh, that would bring in the same amount of tax revenue. Okay. So really, the the process is all about fairly sharing the burden among property owners based on the value of their property. 
and then we may have to we may have a tax rate that's seventy cents, but it brings in the same revenue as the seventy three we have now between the two. Right. So, uh, but is that more likely to impact anything next year by the time everything finishes up? Right. It will. Opposed? It will have little, I believe, effect on this. Okay. Very good. I just wanted to make sure we weren't heading into something with that this year. All right. Um, any other budget discussion? Do you need anything from us out of this? No, and I would just encourage each of you to uh, send me any emails that there are particular items you want me to focus on or think about. Obviously, I'm not taking direction from a person, but I think it's valuable on the overall process as I'm developing, particularly if I get five emails all saying the exact same thing. Yep. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right, and um, authorize use of fire service fund contingency to purchase radios for tanker four. So I mentioned this earlier. Um, the uh, Flint Hill wanted uh, to contact Harris to buy radios, and I told them no. Um, and I, I would like us to be buying these radios just as we have in the past. We purchased the uh, all the mobile radios and all the fire apparatus that are installed today and they're all under warranty with the Harris through the county. And we control um, the quality of the radio and the warranty of the radio and all of that. And I believe that is the, the best way to do this. And I base that on what I did in my past community as well. Um, and I'm working right now, finally, on um, a draft MOU with our partners in Falkir and Culpeper, and Falkir is finally kind of kicking this off, so that we have a common understanding of how the three of us are going to operate this regional system, and uh, to give us all assurance that each of us is going to be doing things in a way that furthers the system and not one of us. Uh, one of those things is making sure that equipment that's used is OEM um, equipment. Uh, so it's my recommendation that the board use some of the money that was appropriated to the fire service fund in the contingency line to purchase these this mobile radio and portable radios and charger uh, for tanker four. Without getting into the discussion of why we have tanker four. I'll make that motion, uh, which is to order the purchase of new ra new radios from Harris based on regional master contract for new tanker four and authorize the use of fire service fund contingency budget for the same. And I would just ask for a little bit of leeway while I work with them to get these quotes right, but those numbers should be pretty pretty close. I'll second. Any discussion? Any further discussion? Madam Chairman, I noticed that there are some people here from Company 4. Did they have anything to add? Ms. Huff is the newly elected president of Company 4, I think I understand. Mr. Forback is vice president. Oh, yes. Congratulations. I think they stayed sat here so long until we had to make them say something. I wrong on something. He talked about, you know, have to be a point where... If everybody goes out and buys food every month, you have to go in and spend ten thousand dollars. Yep. Yeah. So that's where you guys need to sign that you are going to control certain things. Yeah. And you have to push on things. Yeah, it's eye opening for me because I know we had this discussion about the tanker and I mean, as a newbie, um, you don't anticipate what comes after acquiring the piece of equipment. So at least it it it, it gives me more caution than it's probably a small amount of outfitting a truck, you know. But yeah, $8, right. Eight thousand dollars with the hose. What's up? Eight thousand dollars with the hose. Yeah, right. Most other equipment. Right, cars, right. You know, it's, it's, it's a big investment all the way around. It's yeah. Not that piece of equipment. And, you know, again, that's where the department needs to sit down when they decide they want a piece of equipment and. They need to be able to say this is what's going to cost within a couple of dollars. I mean, yep. You know, not be 10, 20, 30,000 dollars off on their projections. Yeah. Yeah, appreciate that. Thank you. All right, any further discussion? We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you for all you're doing. 
Um, I think we say information reports and correspondence is all online and we can see that there. Yeah, if I would allow me just to make one comment relative to the treasurer's report, um, which I'll pause and allow you to say yes, of course. Is that okay? Yes, absolutely. And I do have a question on the treasurer's reports as well. Um, I did want you to see the sales tax chart. Yep. And yep. I did uh, uh, pull those numbers. So the first uh, first two months of quarter one is shown on this chart are actually FY20. Yep. Um, and because of the, it takes a little while for the money to eventually get to us after somebody buys it in a store, buys something in a store and taxes rendered. So for FY21, we have four months of actual revenue received that totals $303,394. So that's 59.75% of your reduced sales tax budget. Remember, we reduced mm -hmm. the budget quite a bit yep. um, uh, for 33% of the year. So sales tax has been much stronger than our budget and much stronger than last year's receipts as shown on this chart. We'll see what happens through the kind of the slow winter months. Yep. Um, and this, that's a perfect lead into my question, Mr. Curry. Um, the, the, the cash, the cash uh, graph, I just had a question about that because in my mind's eye, we have $1.2 million in CARES Act money. We have far better than expected performance on the sales tax revenue side. And then, um, well, those two alone. And then the treasurer and revenue commissioner get real and personal property tax bills out early. And yet, when you look at these graphs, our spread from last year, at least to my eye, is not what you would expect to see. I would expect our cash position to be much better. And I, I assume I'm just not thinking about something and I thought maybe you could provide some insight. I would never suggest you're not thinking about something. <laughs> uh, but we had $1.2 million of CARES Act money. Okay, I think and, that's... And we've spent a lot of that. Okay. Uh, out the door, gone. Uh, and that's for high school auditorium. That's for Chromebooks. That's yep. for fire and rescue yep. companies. Uh, that's for your businesses, you know, et cetera, et cetera. All those things on that chart, that money's out the door uh, with this check run today, okay. uh, with the exception of the portion that was assigned to public safety payroll. Now that money, cash, we still have, right. but it's been accounted for. It's like 300 and something thousand right. dollars, right? right. So, so, so the other part of that, the billing early, that helps bring that chart up um, earlier than it would have otherwise, or not, not allow it to drop as far to the low point. But we still are going to get the same amount of money at the end of the day. It's I get just that. we're going to get it a little bit earlier. And from a cash flow perspective, and it, it doesn't really show up on that chart very well because CARES got in the middle and kind of mucked it up and actually put a lot more cash in our budget. Uh, but that low point is key in your decision making ability and your ability to make use of the cash we have on hand. Yeah. And so if, you, if we can confidently, uh, look, which we did for three years uh, while I've been here, track that cash curve kind of in a similar way, then you know that the cash that's left in the bank on that day, that's money that you can put to work with for capital or one-time use. And this is what, we, what we're nominally considering a reserve, which is something Ms. Smith and I've talked about in the past. It, it is a reserve in some ways, and so you wouldn't want to take all that cash and put it to work and invest it in a building right. or something like that. You would still get debt service if that costs that much more because you just don't know what's going to happen on the worst day of the month for us uh, when the bills have to be paid. If a storm came through or something, you have to front a bunch of money yep. before you get it back from somebody else. Uh, you want to be able to have that available and have that cushion. Uh, most localities have policies set up on the fund balance at the end of the year, um, their fund balance percent or something like that. Yeah. But this low point is really the key on cash. I got you. Yeah, I just, I think it's about a $600,000 spread over last year. And um, it just struck me as, <laughs> I, I thought we were in a much better cash position. And that's, that's just my, you know, not thinking through all these 
yeah, scenarios. So, and, and I realized we're now past December 30th, which was a trigger the, date for The other thing you have to consider is as you adopt your budgets each year, and we will, I will recommend it again this year, you are budgeting to lower that curve when you budget fund balance for one-time uses, right? Uh, but the fact is you've made some of those one-time uses, purchase share of cars or, or whatever, right. and it went up too. So that's, that's where the residual from CARES Act and um, sales tax over it, over what we estimated sort of things come in and work in the opposite direction. So it's almost as if, I mean, absent good performance on the sales tax revenue side, we might be right on top of the last fiscal year at that high point there, right? Pretty darn close. No, because we haven't brought 600000 extra sales tax well, this year, maybe, so far, right? Yeah, right. Maybe Only 20% maybe, increase. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. So uh, that brings up a question that I was wondering, which is, um, you know, we have these CARES expenditures, um, and we hear from the school on a regular basis. Um, would it be appropriate, do you think businesses of Rappahannock would be prepared to do a presentation for us next month on how their disbursement of CARES Act uh, funds yeah, went? Sure. I think that would be um, Great a really um, worthwhile exercise and it kind of help close that circle on how that money was spent. That's a great question. Are there any other, I'm just trying to think, um, within our CARES Act disbursements, is, that, is there any other group from which we need to hear? like that or is that the only one everything else mm -hmm. was direct spend you can look through the, the right the chart it's the the bigger the other big ones which were fire and rescue was um business interruption revenue. Right, right. so it was yeah. made up for their fundraising so they weren't supposed to invest it and do something with it okay yeah that's a good point We're going to have a lot of presentations next month. Hey. <laughs> what order do we do them in? Right, no, early kidding. on. Yep. Current policy. Well, they'll be according to the current policy. Um, anything else under uh, item K? No. Okay. L, matters presented by the board. Anybody have anything this early in January? I had one, but I can go last. I, I just wanted to go back to the committee reports and... Um, I'm not the board's appointee to the Planning Commission, but I think that you and I and Mr. Fraser were all at that meeting, and I just wanted to say how wonderful I thought that dedication um, to Phil Irwin was and how moving Mr. Maxwell's comments were, and, um, and that was just a really, um, a really uplifting part of that meeting, and I'm glad that meeting was so well attended and so many people had an opportunity to hear those comments. I agree. Yes, Mr. Frazier? Uh, I had the uh, pleasant task of running by the landfill on Saturday uh, around 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, and I was stuck in a traffic jam of double lines waiting to throw off trash. And having been around here for a few years, I didn't know anybody. So I asked one of the attendants, I said, where are these people from? <laughs> And he said, except for that car up there, and he pointed at one, he said, everybody's from Culpeper. Mm. So I think we really need to take a look at that system. I thought yeah, we were uh, going to do stickers. So the board, are, you know, you've already assigned me the task of implementing something to restrict it to the county that's uh, It has to be a, a, lot of, a lot of cost there. Uh, I agree. But I certainly don't want to... Uh, to do anything to jeopardize the uh, relationship we have with the uh, volunteers that are running from Culpeper. Right. I think there are ways we can do that. Maybe giving them access. Yeah. But it was, a, it was a real eye opener. <laughs> that's amazing. How was the traffic flow? Because that's my ongoing concern. It, it, it's so tight. At the well, it, it flowed pretty good there, but then after you know we tossed ours out, we could have pulled out and went, except for the second line just kept kept coming and they wouldn't even let us move over into that line to get out. Oh. The one truck and trailer had a lot of stuff, I guess, you know, he had, it didn't look like he had some kind of a commercial thing going, it looked like maybe he just had spring cleaning and two or three uh, trips all in one and... Yeah, we, I, did, we, I did let the board know that I finally do have authorization 
from the legal team to demo the pits. Great. And, uh, and I've had some interest from some contractors that keep e emailing me, but that's another thing on my list. So I w we will get to that. When we do that, I do plan to try to widen that Amosville route just a little bit. There's only so much we can do with the electrical that's in place. And Mr. Curry, I mentioned to you that one constituent had noted that the, the entrance and exit to Flatwood are pretty rough. And so once the pits are demolished, will there be kind of a touch up and graveling? Well, no, we're, we're doing that sooner than that. And that's a routine item. But okay. the person that used to haul stone for us doesn't haul stone anymore. And so that led to a whole process of okay. now we have an account with the quarry and we get it a lot cheaper than we used to. And But it takes okay. one of these sort of things to, for us to dig in and get it all the way to ground and figure out what we need to do to build it back up. And so that should be happening any time now. Okay, great, I'll let them know. I did just want to touch on Flatwood as well because I had a call from a constituent over the weekend. And I know last year we went to extra pains to um, make sure that we had uh, dumpsters going in and out and that there was adequate staffing on certain weekends. Um, I think we just need to earmark every year, the weekend after Thanksgiving, the weekend after Christmas, and New yeah. Year's weekend are high traffic, high volume areas um, for, for both sites and to make sure um, not only that we have um, new facilities coming in, uh, new dumpsters, and the compactors running constantly, but that maybe, um, maybe we need two people on site during those weekends. Is yeah, good. Yeah, I, and I, actually, I reached out to one employee last weekend and said, listen, if you're available uh, overtime, go <laughs> be well, there. We need two people there right now. Well, and I think there was one weekend this past year, and it might have been East, around Easter, that some, like it, it was a state holiday. Nobody should have been there, and there was somebody working. Was it Easter? Probably, and that, those, those uh, holidays are set on our schedule. Okay. Um, I will say that we do struggle, particularly during Christmas, New Year's, because the landfill and their staff is closed a lot of time, too. And so the times where we see heavy use, we also have a little bit less ability to pull containers. And so we did work very closely with Page County to try to get stuff jockeyed around and do what we could. And as far as I know, I think it generally worked. Uh, we had one weekend where somebody moved to town and they brought couple moving trucks and just filled both 40-yard containers. It was like, just bam, full, over time. Oh. VDOT helped us and crushed it down. I got one thing. Yes, we got a couple of vacancies coming up on the Planning Commission, and uh, are we going to advertise for those vacancies? Yes, so or? per your policy, those are advertised the month preceding right. the uh, appointment. The next is in February. That will be advertised in the paper in, this, in January. So Okay, so that's automatic. Yep. Now, if there is a different process other than what's in your policy that the board would like to follow, and I'm referencing this, the library discussion today, right. then I could incorporate that in that um, and, and suggest that applications will be received and then you must attend the meeting or something like that. Uh, I believe uh, the position coming up is for Hampton. And then the next is not till, I believe, June. Okay. And then our higher levy board, um, Ms. Schmidt, we have the opening. And I don't know. Um, That's just an appointment by Ms. Smith uh, at any time she chooses to make it um, without board action. Uh, the only other thing I had for um, ma matters presented by the board, Madam Chairman, if, if there's, I could just have a few minutes. Um, there's no broadband items on the agenda tonight uh, or today. And, um, you know, we voted to establish the authority at the last meeting, which is very nice. But I guess I'm wondering what the next steps and action items are for us and, and what we need to do. And I really think we should have a, a special mid-month meeting, a work session um, to, to work some of that through or, or these other action items that we have ongoing. I did um, talk to Mr. Curry about that. He had submitted the $75 check to Richmond to get us. Well, actually, the check was just approved. <laughs> okay. It'll just go approved. out tomorrow. So it'll go out tomorrow. And so we're not an official broad to do an official handoff, which I think would be very good. And then we also may find committee members that want to continue to help 
um, at that meeting as well. And that's the only update I have. The first meeting of the authority can be a joint meeting, but that's when the authority must develop its bylaws. And so that gets confusing because the, the authority are the same members of the board until one or more board members step back and decide that they're resigning, which I haven't heard yet. Um, it, they are two different bodies. And so the Board of Supervisors would not be setting the bylaws for the Broadband Authority. And the Broadband Authority will have to do that as a corporate body. As soon as the SCC writes back and says, you are officially uh, formed, recorded. Is there any reason we can't start looking at the bylaws that we have and just of course, um, yeah. make some edits yeah. where necessary? I think you could have a draft that is near 100%, and then at your first meeting you could adopt it. Yep, that would be great. I, I think I would still, I'd be leery of three or more future broadband authority members getting together to do that, even if it's not a body yet. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how, how that would work. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? All right, uh, we recess until 7 p.m. and reconvene. 6-11, and we're meeting here, correct? Yes. We're not having a closed session? No. Um, probably next meeting. I guess uh, I'm going to run to the quickie mart.